Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Volume One, Chapter One, in which the reader is introduced to a man of humanity. Late in the afternoon of a chilly day in February, two gentlemen were sitting alone over their wine in a well-furnished dining parlor in the town of P. in Kentucky. There were no servants present, and the gentlemen, with chairs closely approaching, seemed to be discussing some subject with great earnestness. For convenience' sake we have said hitherto two gentlemen. One of the parties, however, when critically examined, did not seem, strictly speaking, to come under the species. He was a short, thick-set man, with coarse, commonplace features, and that swaggering air of pretension which marks a low man who is trying to elbow his way upward in the world. He was much overdressed, in a gaudy vest of many colors, a blue neckerchief, bedropped gaily with yellow spots, and arranged with a flaunting tie, quite in keeping with the general air of the man. His hands, large and coarse, were plentifully bedecked with rings, and he wore a heavy gold watch-chain, with a bundle of seals of portentous size, and a great variety of colors attached to it, which, in the ardor of conversation, he was in the habit of flourishing and jingling with evident satisfaction. His conversation was in free and easy defiance of Murray's grammar. English Grammar, 1795, by Lindley Murray, 1745-1826, to the most authoritative American grammarian of his day, and was garnished at convenient intervals with various profane expressions, which not even the desire to be graphic in our account shall induce us to transcribe. His companion, Mr. Shelby, had the appearance of a gentleman, and the arrangements of the house and the general air of the housekeeping indicated easy and even opulent circumstances. As we before stated, the two were in the midst of an earnest conversation. "'That is the way I should arrange the matter,' said Mr. Shelby. "'I can't make trade that way. I positively can't, Mr. Shelby,' said the other, holding up a glass of wine between his eye and the light. "'Why, the fact is, Haley, Tom is an uncommon fellow. He is certainly worth that sum anywhere. Steady, honest, capable, manages my whole farm like a clock.' "'You mean honest as niggers go?' said Haley, helping himself to a glass of brandy. "'No, I mean, really, Tom is a good, steady, sensible, pious fellow. He got religion at a camp-meeting, four years ago, and I believe he really did get it. I've trusted him, since then, with everything I have—money, house, horses—and let him come and go round the country, and I always found him true and square in everything." "'Some folks don't believe there is pious niggers, Shelby,' said Haley, with a candid flourish of his hand. "'But I do. I had a fellow, now, in this year last lot I took to Orleans. "'Twas as good as a meetin' now, really, to hear that greater pray. "'And he was quite gentle and quiet-like. "'He fetched me a good sum, too, for I bought him cheap of a man that was obliged to sell out. "'So I realized six hundred on him.' Yes, I consider religion a valuable thing in a nigger, when it's the genuine article, and no mistake." "'Well, Tom's got the real article, if ever a fellow had,' rejoined the other. "'Why, last fall I let him go to Cincinnati alone, to do business for me, and bring home five hundred dollars. "'Tom,' says I to him, "'I trust you, because I think you're a Christian. I know you wouldn't cheat. Tom comes back, sure enough. I knew he would. Some low fellows, they say, said to him, "'Tom, why don't you make tracks for Canada?' "'Ah, uh, Master trusted me, and I couldn't,' they told me about it. I am sorry to part with Tom, I must say. You ought to let him cover the whole balance of the debt, and you would, Haley, if you had any conscience." "'Well, I've got just as much conscience as any man in business can afford to keep. Just a little, you know, to swear by, as t'were," said the trader jocularly. And then I'm ready to do anything in reason to oblige friends, but this, yar, you see, is a leetle too hard on a fellow, a leetle too hard." The trader sighed contemplatively, and poured out some more brandy. 
"'Well, then, Haley, how will you trade?' said Mr. Shelby, after an uneasy interval of silence. "'Well, haven't you a boy or a gal that you could throw in with, Tom?' "'Hm. None that I could well spare. To tell the truth, it's only hard necessity makes me willing to sell it all. I don't like parting with any of my hands. That's fact.' Here the door opened, and a small quadroon boy, between four and five years of age, entered the room. There was something in his appearance remarkably beautiful and engaging. His black hair, fine as floss silk, hung in glossy curls about his round, dimpled face, while a pair of large, dark eyes, full of fire and softness, looked out from beneath the rich, long lashes as he peered curiously into the apartment. A gay robe of scarlet and yellow plaid, carefully made and neatly fitted, set off to advantage the dark and rich style of his beauty, and a certain comic air of assurance, blended with bashfulness, showed that he had been not unused to being petted and noticed by his master. "'Hello, Jim Crow,' said Mr. Shelby, whistling and snapping a bunch of raisins towards him. "'Pick that up now.' The child scampered with all his little strength after the prize, while his master laughed. "'Come here, Jim Crow,' said he. The child came up, and the master patted the curly head, and chucked him under the chin. "'Now, Jim, show this gentleman how you can dance and sing.' The boy commenced one of those wild, grotesque songs common among the negroes, in a rich, clear voice, accompanying his singing with many comic evolutions of the hands, feet, and whole body, in all perfect time to the music." "'Bravo!' said Haley, throwing him a quarter of an orange. "'Now, Jim, walk like old Uncle Cudjo when he has the rheumatism,' said his master. Instantly the flexible limbs of the child assumed the appearance of deformity and distortion, as, with his back humped up and his master's stick in his hand, he hobbled about the room, his childish face drawn into a doleful pucker, and spitting from right to left in imitation of an old man." Both gentlemen laughed uproariously. <laughs> <laughs> "'Now, Jim,' said his master, "'show us how old Elder Robbins leads the psalm.' The boy drew his chubby face down to a formidable length, and commenced toning a psalm tune through his nose with imperturbable gravity. "'Hurrah! Bravo! What a young un!' said Haley. "'That chap's a case, I'll promise. Tell you what,' he said, suddenly clapping his hand on Mr. Shelby's shoulder. "'Fling in that chap, and I'll settle the business, I will. Come, now, if that ain't doing the thing up about the rightest.' At this moment the door was pushed gently open, and a young quadroon woman, apparently about twenty-five, entered the room. There needed only a glance from the child to her to identify her as its mother. There was the same rich, full, dark eye, with its long lashes, the same ripples of silky black hair. The brown of her complexion gave way on the cheek to a perceptible flush, which deepened as she saw the gaze of the strange man fixed upon her in bold and undisguised admiration. Her dress was of the neatest possible fit, and set off to advantage her finely moulded shape. A delicately formed hand and a trim foot and ankle were items of appearance that did not escape the quick eye of the trader, well used to run up at a glance the points of a fine female article. "'Well, Eliza?' said her master, as she stopped and looked hesitatingly at him. "'I was looking for Harry, please, sir,' and the boy bounded toward her, showing his spoils, which he had gathered in the skirt of his robe. "'Well, take him away, then,' said Mr. Shelby, and hastily she withdrew, carrying the child on her arm. "'By Jupiter!' said the trader, turning to him in admiration. "'There's an article, now. You might make your fortune on that our gal in New Orleans any day.' I've seen over a thousand in my day paid down for gals, not a bit handsomer." "'I don't want to make my fortune on her,' said Mr. Shelby, dryly, and seeking to turn the conversation he uncorked a bottle of fresh wine, and asked his companion's opinion of it. "'Capital, sir! First chop!' said the trader. Then turning, and slapping his hand familiarly on Shelby's shoulder, he added, "'Come! How will you trade about the gal? What shall I say for her? What, what'll you take?' "'Mr. Haley, she is not to be sold,' said Shelby. "'My wife would not part with her for her weight in gold.' "'Ay, ay, women always say such things, "'cause they hadn't no sort of calculation. 
Just show em how many watches, feathers, and trinkets one's weight in gold would buy, and that alters the case, I reckon. I tell you, Haley, this must not be spoken of. I say no, and I mean no, said Shelby decidedly. Well, you'll let me have the boy, though, said the trader. You must own I've come down pretty handsomely for him. What on earth can you want with the child? said Shelby. Why, I've got a friend that's going into this yar branch of the business, wants to buy up handsome boys to raise for the market. Fancy articles entirely, sell for waiters and so on, to rich uns that can pay for handsome ones. It sets off one of your great places, a real handsome boy to open door, wait, and tend. They fetch a good sum, and this little devil is such a comical musical concern, he's just the article. I would rather not sell him, said Mr. Shelby thoughtfully. The fact is, sir, I'm a humane man, and I hate to take the boy from his mother, sir. Oh, you do? La, yes, something of that are natter. I understand perfectly. It is mighty unpleasant getting on with women sometimes. I allus hates these yar screechin', screamin' times. They are mighty unpleasant. But as I manages business, I generally avoids them, sir. Now, what if you get the girl off for a day or a week or so? Then the thing's done quietly, all over before she comes home. Your wife might get her some earrings or a new gown or some such truck、uh, to make up with her. I'm afraid not. Lor bless you, yes. These critters ain't like white folks, you know. They gets over things, only manage right. Now, they say, said Haley, assuming a candid and confidential air, that this kind of trade is hardening to the feelings. But I never found it so. Fact is, I never could do things up the way some fellers manage the business. I've seen em as would pull a woman's child out of her arms and set em up to sell, and she's screechin' like mad all the time. Very bad policy. Damages the article. Makes em quite unfit for service sometimes. I knew a real handsome gal once in Orleans, as was entirely ruined by this sort of handlin'. The fellow that was tradin' for her didn't want her baby, and she was one of your real high sort when her blood was up. I tell you, she squeezed up her child in her arms and talked and went on real awful. It kinder makes my blood run cold to think of it. And when they carried off the child and locked her up, she just went ravin' mad and died in a week. Clear waste, sir, of a thousand dollars, just for want of management. There's where it is. It's always best to do the humane thing, sir. That's been my experience. And the trader leaned back in his chair and folded his arm. With an air of virtuous decision, apparently considering himself a second Wilberforce. The subject appeared to interest the gentleman deeply, for while Mr. Shelby was thoughtfully peeling an orange, Haley broke out afresh with becoming diffidence, but as if actually driven by the force of truth to say a few words more. It don't look well now for a feller to be praising himself, but I say it just because it's the truth. I believe I'm reckoned to bring in about the finest droves of niggers that is brought in, at least I've been told so. If I have once, I reckon I have a hundred times, all in good case, fat and likely, and I lose as few as any man in the business. And I lays it all to my management, sir, and humanity, sir, I may say, is the great pillar of my management. Mr. Shelby did not know what to say, and so he said, Indeed. Now, I've been laughed at for my notion, sir, and I've been talked to.、Uh, they ain't popular, and they ain't common. But I stuck to em, sir. I've stuck to em, and realized well on em. Yes, sir, they have paid their passage, I may say. And the trader laughed at his joke. There was something so piquant and original in these elucidations of humanity that Mr. Shelby could not help laughing in company. Perhaps you laugh too, dear reader. But you know humanity comes out in a variety of strange forms nowadays, and there is no end to the odd things that humane people will say and do. Mr. Shelby's laugh encouraged the trader to proceed. It's strange now, but I never could beat this into people's heads. Now, there was Tom Loker, my old partner, down in Natchez. He was a clever fellow, Tom was, only the very devil with niggers. On principle, twas, you see, for a better hearted feller never broke bread. Twas his system, sir. 
I used to talk to Tom. Why, Tom, I used to say, when your gals take on and cry, what's the use of crackin' on em over the head and knockin' on em round? It's ridiculous, says I, and don't do no sort of good. Why, I don't see no harm in their cryin', says I. It's nater, says I, and if nater can't blow off one way, it will another. Besides, Tom, says I, it just spiles your gals. They get sickly and down in the mouth, and sometimes they gets ugly, particularly yellow gals do, and it's the devil and all getting on em broke in. Now, says I, why can't you kinder coax em up and speak em fair? Depend on it, Tom, a little humanity thrown in along goes a heap further than all your jawin and crackin, and it pays better, says I. Depend on it. But Tom couldn't get the hang on it, and he spiled so many for me that I had to break off with him, though he was a good-hearted fellow, and as fair a business hand as is goin. And do you find your ways of managing do the business better than Tom's? said Mr. Shelby. Why, yes, sir, I may say so. You see, when I anyways can, I takes a leetle care about the unpleasant parts, like sellin' young uns and that. Get the gals out of the way, out of sight, out of mind, you know. And when it's clean done and can't be helped, they naturally gets used to it. Taint, you know, as if it was white folks that's brought up in the way of spectin' to keep their children and wives and all that. Niggers, you know, that's fetched up properly. Hant no kind of spectations of no kind, so all these things comes easier. I'm afraid mine are not properly brought up, then, said Mr. Shelby. Spose not. You Kentucky folks spile your niggers. You mean well by em, but tain't no real kindness after all. Now, a nigger, you see, what's got to be hacked and tumbled round the world and sold to Tom and Dick and the Lord knows who. Tain't no kindness to be given on him notions and expectations, and bringin' on him up too well, for the rough and tumble comes all the harder on him arter. Now I venture to say your niggers would be quite chop fallen in a place where some of your plantation niggers would be singin' and whoopin' like all possessed. Every man, you know, Mr. Shelby, naturally thinks well on his own ways, and I think I treat niggers just about as well as it's ever worth while to treat em. It's a happy thing to be satisfied," said Mr. Shelby, with a slight shrug, and some perceptible feelings of a disagreeable nature. Well, said Haley, after they had both silently picked their nuts for a season, what do you say? I'll think the matter over and talk with my wife, said Mr. Shelby. Meantime, Haley, if you want the matter carried on in the quiet way you speak of, you'd best not let your business in this neighborhood be known. It will get out among my boys. And it will not be a particularly quiet business getting away any of my fellows if they know it. I'll promise you. Oh, certainly, by all means, mum, of course.、Uh, but I'll tell you, I'm in a devil of a hurry and shall want to know as soon as possible what I may depend on, said he, rising and putting on his overcoat. Well, call up this evening between six and seven, and you shall have my answer, said Mr. Shelby, and the trader bowed himself out of the apartment. I'd like to have been able to kick the fellow down the steps, said he to himself, as he saw the door fairly closed, with his impudent assurance, but he knows how much he has me at advantage. If anybody had ever said to me that I should sell Tom down south to one of those rascally traders, I should have said, Is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? And now it must come, for aught I see, and Eliza's child, too. I know that I shall have some fuss with wife about that, and for that matter about Tom, too. So much for being in debt. Hey, ho!、Oh, the fellow sees his advantage and means to push it. Perhaps the mildest form of the system of slavery is to be seen in the state of Kentucky. The general prevalence of agricultural pursuits of a quiet and gradual nature, not requiring those periodic seasons of hurry and pressure that are called for in the business of more southern districts, makes the task of the negro a more healthful and reasonable one, while the master, content with a more gradual style of acquisition, has not those temptations to hard heartedness which always overcome frail human nature. When the prospect of sudden and rapid gain is weighed in the balance, with no heavier counterpoise than the interests of the helpless and unprotected. Whoever visits some estates there and witnesses the good humoured indulgence of some masters and mistresses, 
and the affectionate loyalty of some slaves, might be tempted to dream the oft-fabled poetic legend of a patriarchal institution and all that. But over and above the scene there broods a portentous shadow, the shadow of law. So long as the law considers all these human beings, with beating hearts and living affections, only as so many things belonging to a master, so long as the failure, or misfortune, or imprudence, or death of the kindest owner, may cause them any day to exchange a life of kind protection and indulgence for one of hopeless misery and toil, so long it is impossible to make anything beautiful or desirable in the best regulated administration of slavery. Mr. Shelby was a fair average kind of man, good-natured and kindly, and disposed to easy indulgence of those around him, and there had never been a lack of anything which might contribute to the physical comfort of the negroes on his estate. He had, however, speculated largely and quite loosely, had involved himself deeply, and his notes to a large amount had come into the hands of Haley, and this small piece of information is the key to the preceding conversation. Now, it had so happened that, in approaching the door, Eliza had caught enough of the conversation to know that a trader was making offers to her master for somebody. She would gladly have stopped at the door to listen as she came out, but her mistress just then calling, she was obliged to hasten away. Still, she thought she heard the trader make an offer for her boy. Could she be mistaken? Her heart swelled and throbbed, and she involuntarily strained him so tight that the little fellow looked up into her face in astonishment. "'Eliza, girl, what ails you to-day?' said her mistress, when Eliza had upset the wash-pitcher, knocked down the work-stand, and finally was abstractedly offering her mistress a long nightgown in place of the silk dress she had ordered her to bring from the wardrobe. Eliza started. "'Oh, missus,' she said, raising her eyes. Then, bursting into tears, she sat down in a chair and began sobbing. "'Why, Eliza, child, what ails you?' said her mistress. "'Oh, missus, missus,' said Eliza, "'there's been a traitor talking with master in the parlor. I heard him.' "'Well, silly child, suppose there was. Oh, missus, do you suppose master would sell my Harry?' And the poor creature threw herself into a chair and sobbed convulsively. "'Sell him? No, you foolish girl. You know your master never deals with those southern traders, and never means to sell any of his servants, as long as they behave well. Why, you silly child, who do you think would want to buy your Harry? Do you think all the world are set on him as you are, you goosey? Come, cheer up, and hook my dress. There, now, put my back hair up in that pretty braid you learnt the other day, and don't go listening at doors any more. "'Well, but, Mrs., you never would give your consent to—to—' "'Nonsense, child. To be sure I shouldn't. What do you talk so for? I would as soon have one of my own children sold. But really, Eliza, you are getting altogether too proud of that little fellow. A man can't put his nose into the door, but you think he must be coming to buy him.' Reassured by her mistress's confident tone, Eliza proceeded nimbly and adroitly with her toilet laughing at her own fears as she proceeded. Mrs. Shelby was a woman of high class, both intellectually and morally. To that natural magnanimity and generosity of mind which one often marks as characteristic of the women of Kentucky, she added high moral and religious sensibility and principle, carried out with great energy and ability into practical results. Her husband, who made no professions to any particular religious character, nevertheless reverenced and respected the consistency of hers, and stood, perhaps, a little in awe of her opinion. Certain it was that he gave her unlimited scope in all her benevolent efforts for the comfort, instruction, and improvement of her servants, though he never took any decided part in them himself. In fact, if not exactly a believer in the doctrine of the efficiency of the extra good works of saints, he really seemed somehow or other to fancy that his wife had piety and benevolence enough for two, to indulge a shadowy expectation of getting into heaven through her superabundance of qualities, to which he made no particular pretension. The heaviest load on his mind, after his conversation with the trader, lay in the foreseen necessity of breaking to his wife the arrangement contemplated meeting the importunities and opposition which he knew he should have reason to encounter. 
Mrs. Shelby, being entirely ignorant of her husband's embarrassments, and knowing only the general kindliness of his temper, had been quite sincere in the entire incredulity with which she had met Eliza's suspicions. In fact, she dismissed the matter from her mind, without a second thought, and, being occupied in preparations for an evening visit, it passed out of her thoughts entirely. End of chapter 1 Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 2 The Mother Eliza had been brought up by her mistress, from girlhood, as a petted and indulged favorite. The traveler in the South must often have remarked that peculiar air of refinement, that softness of voice and manner, which seems in many cases to be a particular gift to the quadroon and mulatto women. These natural graces in the quadroon are often united with beauty of the most dazzling kind, and in almost every case with a personal appearance prepossessing and agreeable. Eliza, such as we have described her, is not a fancy sketch, but taken from remembrance as we saw her years ago in Kentucky. Safe under the protecting care of her mistress, Eliza had reached maturity without those temptations which make beauty so fatal an inheritance to a slave. She had been married to a bright and talented young mulatto man, who was a slave on a neighboring estate, and bore the name of George Harris. This young man had been hired out by his master to work in a bagging factory, where his adroitness and ingenuity caused him to be considered the first hand in the place. He had invented a machine for the cleaning of the hemp, which, considering the education and circumstances of the inventor, displayed quite as much mechanical genius as Whitney's cotton-gin. Note, a machine of this description was really the invention of a young colored man in Kentucky. Mrs. Stowe's note. He was possessed of a handsome person and pleasing manners, and was a general favorite in the factory. Nevertheless, as this young man was in the eye of the law not a man but a thing, all these superior qualifications were subject to the control of a vulgar, narrow-minded, tyrannical master. This same gentleman, having heard of the fame of George's invention, took a ride over to the factory to see what this intelligent chattel had been about. He was received with great enthusiasm by the employer, who congratulated him on possessing so valuable a slave. He was waited upon over the factory, shown the machinery by George, who, in high spirits, talked so fluently, held himself so erect, looked so handsome and manly, that his master began to feel an uneasy consciousness of inferiority. What business had this slave to be marching round the country, inventing machines, and holding up his head among gentlemen? He'd soon put a stop to it. He'd take him back, and put him to hoeing and digging, and see if he'd step about so smart. Accordingly, the manufacturer and all hands concerned were astounded when he suddenly demanded George's wages, and announced his intention of taking him home. "'But, uh, Mr. Harris,' remonstrated the manufacturer, "'isn't this uh, rather sudden? What if it is? Isn't the man mine?' "'We would be willing, sir, to increase the rate of compensation.' "'No object at all, sir. I don't need to hire any of my hands out, unless I've a mind to.' "'But, sir, he seems peculiarly adapted to this business.' "'Dare say he may be. Never was much adapted to anything that I set him about, I'll be bound.' "'But only think of his inventing this machine,' interposed one of the workmen, rather unluckily. "'Oh, yes, a machine for saving work, is it? He'd invent that, I'll be bound. Let a nigger alone for that any time. They are all labor-saving machines themselves, every one of them. No, he shall tramp.' George had stood like one transfixed, at hearing his doom thus suddenly pronounced by a power that he knew was irresistible. He folded his arms, tightly pressed in his lips, but a whole volcano of bitter feelings burned in his bosom, and sent streams of fire through his veins. He breathed short, and his large dark eyes flashed like live coals, and he might have broken out into some dangerous ebullition had not the kindly manufacturer touched him on the arm and said in a low tone, Give way, George. Go with him for the present. We'll try to help you yet." The tyrant observed the whisper, and conjectured its import, though he could not hear what was said, and he inwardly strengthened himself in his determination to keep the power he possessed over his victim. George was taken home, and put to the meanest drudgery of the farm. 
he had been able to repress every disrespectful word, but the flashing eye, the gloomy and troubled brow, were part of a natural language that could not be repressed. Indubitable signs which showed too plainly that the man could not become a thing. It was during the happy period of his employment in the factory that George had seen and married his wife. During that period, being much trusted and favored by his employer, he had free liberty to come and go at discretion. The marriage was highly approved of by Mrs. Shelby, who, with a little womanly complacency in matchmaking, felt pleased to unite her handsome favorite with one of her own class who seemed in every way suited to her. And so they were married in her mistress's great parlor and her mistress herself adorned the bride's beautiful hair with orange blossoms, and threw over it the bridal veil, which certainly could scarce have rested on a fairer head. And there was no lack of white gloves, and cake, and wine, of admiring guests to praise the bride's beauty, and her mistress's indulgence and liberality. For a year or two Eliza saw her husband frequently, and there was nothing to interrupt their happiness except the loss of two infant children to whom she was passionately attached, and whom she mourned with a grief so intense as to call for gentle remonstrance from her mistress, who sought, with maternal anxiety, to direct her naturally passionate feelings within the bounds of reason and religion. After the birth of little Harry, however, she had gradually become tranquilized and settled, and every bleeding tie and throbbing nerve once more entwined with that little life seemed to become sound and healthful, and Eliza was a happy woman up to the time that her husband was rudely torn from his kind employer, and brought under the iron sway of his legal owner. The manufacturer, true to his word, visited Mr. Harris a week or two after George had been taken away, when, as he hoped, the heat of the occasion had passed away, and tried every possible inducement to lead him to restore him to his former employment. "'You needn't trouble yourself to talk any longer,' said he, doggedly. "'I know my own business, sir.' "'I did not presume to interfere with it, sir. I only thought that you might think it for your interest to let your man to us on the terms proposed.' "'Oh, I understand the matter well enough. I saw your winking and whispering the day I took him out of the factory. But you don't come it over me that way. It's a free country, sir. The man's mine, and I do what I please with him. That's it.' And so fell George's last hope. Nothing before him but a life of toil and drudgery, rendered more bitter by every little smarting vexation and indignity which tyrannical ingenuity could devise. A very humane jurist once said, The worst use you can put a man to is to hang him. No, there is another use that a man can be put to that is worse. End of chapter 2 Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter Three: The Husband and Father Mrs. Shelby had gone on her visit, and Eliza stood in the veranda, rather dejectedly looking after the retreating carriage, when a hand was laid on her shoulder. She turned, and a bright smile lighted up her fine eyes. "'George, is it you? How you frightened me! Well, I am so glad you's come. Mrs. is gone to spend the afternoon. So come into my little room, and we'll have this time all to ourselves." Saying this, she drew him into a neat little apartment opening on the veranda, where she generally sat at her sewing, within call of her mistress. "'How glad I am! Why don't you smile? And look at Harry, how he grows!' The boy stood shyly regarding his father through his curls, holding close to the skirts of his mother's dress. "'Isn't he beautiful?' said Eliza, lifting his long curls and kissing him. "'I wish she'd never been born,' said George bitterly. "'I wish I'd never been born myself.' Surprised and frightened, Eliza sat down, leaned her head on her husband's shoulder, and burst into tears. "'There now, Eliza, it's too bad for me to make you feel so, poor girl,' said he fondly. "'It's too bad. Oh, how I wish you never had seen me!' You might have been happy. George, George, how can you talk so? What dreadful thing has happened, or is going to happen? I'm sure we've been very happy till lately. So we have, dear, said George. Then drawing his child on his knee, he gazed intently on his glorious dark eyes, and passed his hands through his long curls. 
just like you, Eliza. And you are the handsomest woman I ever saw, and the best one I ever wished to see. But, oh, I wish I'd never seen you, nor you me. Oh, George, how can you? Yes, Eliza, it's all misery, misery, misery. My life is bitter as wormwood. The very life is burning out of me. I'm a poor, miserable, forlorn drudge. I shall only drag you down with me, that's all. What's the use of our trying to do anything, trying to do no anything, trying to, to be anything? What's the use of living? I wish I was dead. Oh, now, dear George, that is really wicked. I know how you feel about losing your place in the factory, and you have a hard master. But pray be patient, and perhaps something— Patient! said he, interrupting her. Haven't I been patient? Did I say a word when he came and took me away, for no earthly reason, from the place where everybody was kind to me? I paid him truly every cent of my earnings, and they all say I worked well. Well, it is dreadful, said Eliza. But after all, he is your master, you know. My master! And who made him my master? That's what I think of. What right has he to me? I'm a man as much as he is. I'm a better man than he is. I know more about business than he does. I am a better manager than he is. I can read better than he can. I can write a better hand. And I've learned it all myself, and no thanks to him. I've learned it in spite of him. And now what right has he to make a dray-horse of me, to take me from things I can do, and do better than he can, and put me to work that any horse can do? He tries to do it. He says he'll bring me down and humble me and he puts me to just the hardest, meanest, and dirtiest work on purpose. Oh, George, George, you frighten me. Why, I never heard you talk so. I'm afraid you'll do something dreadful. I don't wonder at your feelings at all, but, oh, do be careful, do, do for my sake, for Harry's. I have been careful, and I have been patient, but it's growing worse and worse. Flesh and blood can't bear it any longer. Every chance he can get to insult and torment me, he takes. I thought I could do my work well, and keep on quiet, and have some time to read and learn out of work hours. But the more he see I can do, the more he loads on. He says that, though I don't say anything, he sees I got the devil in me, and he means to bring it out. And one of these days it will come out in a way that he won't like, or I'm mistaken. "'Oh, dear, what shall we do?' said Eliza mournfully. "'It was only yesterday,' said George. As I was busy loading stones into a cart, that young Massa Tom stood there, slashing his whip so near the horse that the creature was frightened. I asked him to stop, as pleasant as I could. He just kept right on. I begged him again, and then he turned on me and began striking me. I held his hand, and then he screamed and kicked and ran to his father, and told him that I was fighting him. He came in a rage, and said he'd teach me who was my master and he tied me to a tree and cut switches for young master and told him that he might whip me till he was tired and he did do it if i don't make him remember it some time and the brow of the young man grew dark and his eyes burned with an expression that made his young wife tremble who made this man my master that's what i want to know he said well said eliza mournfully i always thought that i must obey my master and mistress or i couldn't be a christian there is some sense in it, in your case. They have brought you up like a child, fed you, clothed you, indulged you, and taught you, so that you have a good education. That is some reason why they should claim you. But I have been kicked and cuffed and sworn at, and at the best only let alone. And what do I owe? I have paid for all my keeping a hundred times over. I won't bear it. No, I won't, he said, clenching his hand with a fierce frown. Eliza trembled and was silent. She had never seen her husband in this mood before, and her gentle system of ethics seemed to bend like a reed in the surges of such passion. "'You know poor little Carlo that you gave me,' added George. "'The creature has been about all the comfort that I've had. He has slept with me nights, and followed me round days, and kind of looked at me as if he understood how I felt. Well, the other day I was just feeding him with a few old scraps I picked up by the kitchen door and Master came along, and said I was feeding him up at his expense, and that he couldn't afford to have every nigger keeping his dog, and ordered me to tie a stone to his neck and throw him into the pond. 
Oh, George, you didn't do it. Do it? Not I, but he did. Masser and Tom pelted the poor drowning creature with stones, poor thing. He looked at me so mournful as if he wondered why I didn't save him. I had to take a flogging because I wouldn't do it myself. I don't care. Massa will find out that I'm one that whipping won't tame. My day will come yet, if he don't look out. What are you going to do? Oh, George, don't do anything wicked. If you only trust in God and try to do right, he'll deliver you. I ain't a Christian like you, Eliza. My heart's full of bitterness. I can't trust in God. Why does he let things be so? Oh, George, we must have faith. Mistress says that when all things go wrong to us, we must believe that God is doing the very best. That's easy to say for people that are sitting on their sofas and riding in their carriages. But let them be where I am. I guess it would come some harder. I wish I could be good. But my heart burns and can't be reconciled anyhow. You couldn't in my place. You can't now, if I tell you all I've got to say. You don't know the whole yet. What can be coming now? Well... Lately Massa's been saying that he was a fool to let me marry off the place, and that he hates Mr. Shelby and all his tribe because they are proud and hold their heads up above him, and that I've got proud notions from you, and he says he won't let me come here any more, and that I shall take a wife and settle down on his place. At first he only scolded and grumbled these things. But yesterday he told me that I should take Mina for a wife and settle down in a cabin with her, or he would sell me down river. Why, but you were married to me, by the minister, as much as if you'd been a white man," said Eliza simply. Don't you know a slave can't be married? There is no law in this country for that. I can't hold you for my wife if he chooses to part us. That's why I wish I'd never seen you. Why, I wish I'd never been born. It would have been better for us both. It would have been better for this poor child if he had never been born. All this may happen to him yet. Oh, but Master is so kind. Yes, but who knows? He may die, and then he may be sold as nobody knows who. What pleasure is it that he is handsome and smart and bright? I tell you, Eliza, that a sword will pierce through your soul for every good and pleasant thing your child is or has. It will make him worth too much for you to keep. The words smote heavily on Eliza's heart. The vision of the trader came before her eyes, and as if someone had struck her a deadly blow, she turned pale and gasped for breath. She looked nervously out on the veranda where the boy, tired of the grave conversation, had retired, and where he was riding triumphantly up and down on Mr. Shelby's walking-stick. He would have spoken to tell her husband her fears, but checked herself. "'No, no, he has enough to bear, poor fellow,' she thought. "'No, I won't tell him. Besides, it ain't true. Mrs. never deceives us.' So, Eliza, my girl, said the husband mournfully, bear up now, and good-bye, for I'm going. Going, George? Going where? To Canada, said he, straightening himself up, and when I'm there, I'll buy you. That's all the hope that's left us. You have a kind master that won't refuse to sell you. I'll buy you and the boy. God helping me, I will. Oh, dreadful! If you should be taken— I won't be taken, Eliza. I'll die first. I'll be free, or I'll die. You won't kill yourself. No need of that. They will kill me fast enough. They never will get me down the river alive. Oh, George, for my sake, do be careful. Don't do anything wicked. Don't lay hands on yourself or anybody else. You are tempted too much, too much. But don't— Go you must, but go carefully, prudently. Pray God to help you. Well, then, Eliza, hear my plan. Massa took it into his head to send me right by here with a note to Mr. Symes that lives a mile past. I believe he expected I should come here to tell you what I have. It would please him if he thought it would aggravate Shelby's folks, as he calls them. I'm going home quite resigned, you understand, as if all was over. I've got some preparations made, and there are those that will help me and in the course of a week or so I shall be among the missing some day. Pray for me, Eliza. Perhaps the good Lord will hear you." "'Oh, pray yourself, George, and go trusting in him. Then you won't do anything wicked.' "'Well, now, good-bye,' said George, holding Eliza's hands and gazing into her eyes without moving. 
They stood silent. Then there were last words, and sobs, and bitter weeping. Such parting as those may make whose hope to meet again is as the spider's web, and the husband and wife were parted. End of chapter 3 Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 4 An Evening in Uncle Tom's Cabin The cabin of Uncle Tom was a small log building close adjoining to the house, as the negro par excellence designates his master's dwelling. In front it had a neat garden patch where, every summer, strawberries, raspberries, and a variety of fruits and vegetables flourished under careful tending. The whole front of it was covered by a large scarlet bignonia and a native multiflora rose, which, in twisting and interlacing, left scarce a vestige of the rough logs to be seen. Here also in summer various brilliant annuals, such as marigolds, petunias, four o'clocks, found an indulgent corner in which to unfold their splendors, and were the delight and pride of Aunt Chloe's heart. Let us enter the dwelling. The evening meal at the house is over, and Aunt Chloe, who presided over its preparations as head cook, has left to inferior officers in the kitchen the business of clearing away and washing dishes, and come out into her own snug territories, to get her old man's supper. Therefore doubt not that it is her you see by the fire, presiding with anxious interest over certain frizzling items in a stew-pan, and anon, with grave consideration, lifting the cover of a bake-kettle, from whence steam forth indubitable intimations of something good. A round, black, shining face is hers, so glossy as to suggest the idea that she might have been washed over with white of eggs, like one of her own tea-rusks. Her whole plump countenance beams with satisfaction and contentment from under her well-starched checked turban, bearing on it, however, if we must confess it, a little of that tinge of self-consciousness which becomes the first cook of the neighborhood, as Aunt Chloe was universally held and acknowledged to be. A cook she certainly was, in the very bone and center of her soul. Not a chicken or turkey or duck in the barnyard but looked grave when they saw her approaching, and seemed evidently to be reflecting on their latter end and certain it was that she was always meditating on trussing, stuffing, and roasting, to a degree that was calculated to inspire terror in any reflecting foul living. Her corn-cake, in all its varieties of hoe-cake, dodgers, muffins, and other species too numerous to mention, was a sublime mystery to all less practiced compounders, and she would shake her fat sides with honest pride and merriment, as she would narrate the fruitless efforts that one and another of her compeers had made to attain to her elevation. The arrival of company at the house, the arranging of dinners and suppers in style, awoke all the energies of her soul, and no sight was more welcome to her than a pile of travelling trunks launched on the veranda, for then she foresaw fresh efforts and fresh triumphs. Just at present, however, Aunt Chloe is looking into the bake-pan, in which congenial operation we shall leave her till we finish our picture of the cottage. In one corner of it stood a bed, covered neatly with a snowy spread, and by the side of it was a piece of carpeting of some considerable size. On this piece of carpeting Aunt Chloe took her stand, as being decidedly in the upper walks of life, and it, and the bed by which it lay, and the whole corner, in fact, were treated with distinguished consideration, and made, so far as possible, sacred from the marauding inroads and desecrations of little folks. In fact, that corner was the drawing-room of the establishment. In the other corner was a bed of much humbler pretensions, and evidently designed for use. The wall over the fireplace was adorned with some very brilliant scriptural prints, and a portrait of General Washington, drawn and colored in a manner which would certainly have astonished that hero, if ever he happened to meet with its like. On a rough bench in the corner, a couple of woolly-headed boys, with glistening black eyes and fat shining cheeks, were busy in superintending the first walking operations of the baby, which, as is usually the case, consisted in getting up on its feet, balancing a moment, and then tumbling down. 
each successive failure being violently cheered as something decidedly clever. A table, somewhat rheumatic in its limbs, was drawn out in front of the fire, and covered with a cloth, displaying cups and saucers of a decidedly brilliant pattern, with other symptoms of an approaching meal. At this table was seated Uncle Tom, Mr. Shelby's best hand, who, as he is to be the hero of our story, we must daguerreotype for our readers. He was a large, broad-chested, powerfully made man, of a full glossy black, and a face whose truly African features were characterized by an expression of grave and steady good sense, united with much kindliness and benevolence. There was something about his whole air self-respecting and dignified, yet united with a confiding and humble simplicity. He was very busy, at this moment, on a slate lying before him, on which he was carefully and slowly endeavouring to accomplish a copy of some letters, in which operation he was overlooked by young Master George, a smart, bright boy of thirteen, who appeared fully to realise the dignity of his position as instructor. "'Not that way, Uncle Tom, not that way,' said he, briskly, as Uncle Tom laboriously brought up the tail of his G the wrong side out. "'That makes a Q, you see.' "'La sakes, now, does it?' said Uncle Tom, looking with a respectful, admiring air, as his young teacher flourishingly scrawled Q's and G's innumerable for his edification, and then, taking the pencil in his big, heavy fingers, he patiently recommenced. "'How easy white folks allus does things,' said Aunt Chloe, pausing while she was greasing a griddle with a scrap of bacon on her fork, and regarding young Master George with pride. "'The way he can write now, and read, too, and then to come out here evenings and read his lessons to us, it's mighty interesting.' "'But, Aunt Chloe, I'm getting mighty hungry,' said George. "'Isn't that cake in the skillet almost done?' "'Most done, Master George,' said Aunt Chloe, lifting the lid and peeping in. Browning beautiful, a real lovely brown. Ah, uh, let me alone for that. Missus let Sally try to make some cake t'other day, just to larn her. She said, "Oh, go away, Missus," said I. It really hurts my feelings now to see good vittles spout that our way. Cake rise all to one side, no shape at all, no more than my shoe. Go away. And with this final expression of contempt for Sally's greenness, Aunt Chloe whipped the cover off the bake kettle and disclosed to view a neatly baked pound-cake, of which no city confectioner need to have been ashamed. This being evidently the central point of the entertainment, Aunt Chloe began now to bustle about earnestly in the supper department. "'Here you, Mose and Pete! Get out the way, you niggers! Get away, Meriky, honey! Mammy'll give her baby some fin by and by. Now, Master George, you just take off them books, and set down now with my old man, and I'll take up the sausages and have the first griddle full of cakes on your plates in less than no time. They wanted me to come to dinner in the house, said George, but I knew what was what too well for that, Aunt Chloe. So you did, so you did, honey, said Aunt Chloe, heaping the smoking batter cakes on his plate. You knowed your old auntie'd keep the best for you. Oh, let you alone for that. Go away. And with that, auntie gave George a nudge with her finger, designed to be immensely facetious and turned again to her griddle with great briskness. "'Now for the cake,' said Massa George, when the activity of the griddle department had somewhat subsided, and with that the youngster flourished a large knife over the article in question. "'La, bless you, Massa George,' said Aunt Chloe, with earnestness, catching his arm. "'You wouldn't be for cutting it with that our great heavy knife. Smash all down, spile all the pretty rise of it. Here, I've got a thin old knife. I keeps sharp a purpose.' Dar now, see? Comes apart light as a feather. Now, eat away. You won't get anything to beat that ar. Tom Lincoln says, said George, speaking with his mouthful, that there Jinny is a better cook than you. Them Lincolns ain't much count, no way, said Aunt Chloe, contemptuously. I mean, set alongside our folks. They spectable folks enough in a kinder plain way, but as to getting up anything in style, they don't begin to have a notion on it. Set Master Lincoln now, alongside Master Shelby. Good Lord! And Mrs. Lincoln! Can she kinder sweep it into a room like my missus? So kinder splendid, you know. Oh, go away! Don't tell me nothing of them Lincolns!" And Aunt Chloe tossed her head, as one who hoped she did know something of the world. 
"'Well, though, I've heard you say,' said George, "'that Jinny was a pretty fair cook.' "'So I did,' said Aunt Chloe. "'I may say that. Good, plain, common cookin'. Jinny'll do. Make a good pone of bread. Bile or taters far. Her corn cakes isn't extra, not extra now. Jinny's corn cakes isn't. But then they's far. But lor, come to be hired branches, and what can she do? Why, she makes pies. Sartin she does. But what kind of crust? Can she make your real flecky paste, as melts in your mouth and lies all up like a puff? Now, I went over thar when Miss Mary was gwine to be married, and Jinny she just showed me the, the wedding pies. Jinny and I is good friends, you know. I never said nothing. But go long, Master George. Why, I shouldn't sleep a wink for a week if I had a batch of pies like them are. Why, they want no count tall. I suppose Jinny thought they were ever so nice, said George. Thought so, didn't she? Thar she was, showin' em as innocent. You see, it's just here. Jinny don't know. Lord, the family ain't nothin'. She can't be spected to know. Tant no fault am. Oh, Master George, you doesn't know half your privileges in your family in bringin' up. Here Aunt Chloe sighed and rolled up her eyes with emotion. I'm sure, Aunt Chloe, I understand. I, my pie and pudding privileges, said George. Ask Tom Lincoln if I don't crow over him every time I meet him. Aunt Chloe sat back in her chair and indulged in a hearty guffaw of laughter at this witticism of young Masser's, laughing till the tears rolled down her black, shining cheeks, and varying the exercise with playfully slapping and poking Master Georgie, and telling him to go away, and that he was a case, that he was fit to kill her, and that he sartin would kill her one of these days, and between each of these sanguinary predictions, going off into a laugh, each longer and stronger than the other till George really began to think that he was a very dangerously witty fellow, and that it became him to be careful how he talked, as funny as he could. "'And so ye yelled, Tom, did ye? Oh, Lord, what young'uns will be up to? Ye crowed over, Tom! Oh, Lord! Master George, if ye wouldn't make a horned bug laugh!' "'Yes,' said George. I says to him, "'Tom, you ought to see some of Aunt Chloe's pies. They're the right sort,' says I. Pity now Tom couldn't, said Aunt Chloe, on whose benevolent heart the idea of Tom's benighted condition seemed to make a strong impression. You ought to just ask him here to dinner some of these times, Master George, she added. It would look quite pretty of you. You know, Master George, you oughtn't to feel above nobody on count your privileges, cause all our privileges is given to us. We ought all us to remember that, said Aunt Chloe, looking quite serious. "'Well, I mean to ask Tom here some day next week,' said George. "'And you do your prettiest, Aunt Chloe, and we'll make him stare. Won't we make him eat so he won't get over it for a fortnight?' "'Yes, yes, certain,' said Uncle Chloe, delighted. "'You'll see, Lord, to think of some of our dinners. You mind that our great chicken pie made when we go to dinner to General Knox? I and Mrs. we come pretty near quarreling about that our crust.' What does get into ladies sometimes, I don't know. But sometimes, when a body has the heaviest kind of sponsibility on him, as ye may say, uh, and is all kind of serious and taken up, they takes that our time to be hanging round and kind of interfering. Now, Missus, she wanted me to do this way, and she wanted me to do that way. And finally I got kind of sarcy and says, Now, Missus, do just look at them beautiful white hands o' yourn, with long fingers and all them sparkly with rings, like my white lilies when the dew's on em. And look at my great black stumpin' hands. Now, don't you think that the Lord must have meant me to make the pie-crust, and you to stay in the parlor? Dar, I was just so sarcy, Mas George. And what did Mother say? said George. Say? Why, she kind of larfed in her eyes, them great handsome eyes o' hern. Oh, and says she, Well, Aunt Chloe, I think you are about in the right on it, says she, and she went off in the parlor. She ought to crack me over the head for being so sarcy, but thar's war it is. I can't do nothing with ladies in the kitchen. Well, you made out well with that dinner. I remember everybody said so, said George. Didn't I? And want I behind the dining room door that berry day? And didn't I see the general pass his plate three times for some more that berry pie? And says he, you must have an uncommon cook, Mrs. Shelby. Lord, I was fit to split myself. And the general, he knows what cooking is, said Aunt Chloe, drawing herself up with an air. Very nice man, the general. He comes of one of the 
very fustest families in old Virginia. He knows what's what now, as well as I do, de general. You see, there's pants in all pies, Master George, but tain't everybody knows what they is, or as order be. But de general he knows. I knew by his marks he made. Yes, he knows what de pants is. By this time Master George had arrived at that pass to which even a boy can come, under uncommon circumstances, when he really could not eat another morsel. And, therefore, he was at leisure to notice the pile of woolly heads and glistening eyes which were regarding their operations hungrily from the opposite corner. "'Here you, Mose, Pete,' he said, breaking off liberal bits and throwing it at them. "'You want some, don't you? Come, Aunt Chloe, bake them some cakes.' And George and Tom moved to a comfortable seat in the chimney-corner, while Aunt Chloe, after baking a goodly pile of cakes, took her baby on her lap, and began alternately filling its mouth and her own, and distributing to Mose and Pete, who seemed rather to prefer eating theirs as they rolled about on the floor under the table, tickling each other, and occasionally pulling the baby's toes. "'Oh, go long, will ye?' said the mother, giving now and then a kick, in a kind of a general way, under the table, when the movement became too obstreperous. Can't you be decent when white folks comes to see you? Stop dat ar now, will you? Better mind yourselves, or I'll take you down a buttonhole lower when Massa George is gone. What meaning was couched under this terrible threat, it is difficult to say, but certain it is that its awful indistinctness seemed to produce very little impression on the young sinners addressed. La now, said Uncle Tom, they are so full of tickle all the while. They can't behave themselves. Here the boys emerged from under the table, and, with hands and faces well plastered with molasses, began a vigorous kissing of the baby. "'Get along with you,' said the mother, pushing away their woolly heads. "'You'll all stick together and never get clar if you do that fashion. Go along to spring and wash yourselves,' she said, seconding her exhortations with a slap which resounded very formidably, but which seemed only to knock out so much more laugh from the young ones as they tumbled precipitately over each other out the doors, where they fairly screamed with merriment. "'Did you ever see such aggravating young uns?' said Aunt Chloe, rather complacently, as, producing an old towel kept for such emergencies, she poured a little water out of the cracked teapot on it, and began rubbing off the molasses from the baby's face and hands. And, having polished her till she shone, she set her down in Tom's lap while she busied herself in clearing away supper. The baby employed the intervals in pulling Tom's nose, scratching his face, and burying her fat hands in his woolly hair, which last operation seemed to afford her special content. "'Ain't she a pert young un?' said Tom, holding her from him to take a full-length view. Then, getting up, he set her on his broad shoulder, and began capering and dancing with her, while Master George snapped at her with his pocket-handkerchief, and Mose and Pete, now returned again, roared after her like bears, till Aunt Chloe declared that they fairly took her head off with their noise. As, according to her own statement, this surgical operation was a matter of daily occurrence in the cabin, the declaration no whit abated the merriment, till every one had roared and tumbled and danced themselves down to a state of composure. "'Well, now, I hopes you're done,' said Aunt Chloe, who had been busy in pulling out a rude box of a trundle-bed. And now you and Mose and Pete get into thar, for we's going to have the meetin'. Oh, mother, we don't want her. We wants to sit up to meetin'. Meetin' is so curious. We likes him. Lie, Aunt Chloe, shove it under and let him sit up," said Massa George decisively, giving a push to the rude machine. Aunt Chloe, having thus saved appearances, seemed highly delighted to push the thing under, saying as she did so, "Well, maybe twill do him some good." The House now resolved itself into a committee of the whole to consider the accommodations and arrangements for the meeting. "'What we's to do for cheers now, I declare I don't know,' said Aunt Chloe. As the meeting had been held at Uncle Tom's Weekly for an indefinite length of time, without any more cheers, there seemed some encouragement to hope that a way would be discovered at present. "'Old Uncle Peter sung both de legs out of dat oldest cheer last week,' suggested Mose. "'You go long. I'll bound you pulled him out. Some of your shines,' said Aunt Chloe. "'Well, it'll stand, if it only keeps jam up again the wall,' said Mose. "'Then Uncle Peter mustn't sit in it, cause he allus hitches when he gets a-singin'. He hitched pretty nigh across the room t'other night,' said Pete. 
"'Good Lord, get him in it, then,' said Mose. "'And then he'd begin, "'Come, saints and sinners, hear me tell,' and then down he'd go." And Mose imitated precisely the nasal tones of the old man, tumbling on the floor to illustrate the supposed catastrophe. "'Come now, be decent, can't you?' said Aunt Chloe. "'Ain't you ashamed?' Master George, however, joined the offender in the laugh, and declared decidedly that Mose was a buster, so the maternal admonition seemed rather to fail of effect. "'Well, old man,' said Aunt Chloe, "'you'll have to tote in them our barrels. Mother's barrels is like that our widders, Master George was reading about in the good book. They never fails,' said Mose, aside to Peter. "'I'm sure one of them caved in last week,' said Pete, "'and let em all down in the middle o' dat singin' dat ar was failin', warn't it?' During this aside between Mose and Pete, two empty casks had been rolled into the cabin, and being secured from rolling by stones on each side, boards were laid across them, which arrangement, together with the turning down of certain tubs and pails, and the disposing of the rickety chairs, at last completed the preparation. "'Master George is such a beautiful reader now. I know he'll stay to read for us,' said Aunt Chloe. "'Pears like twill be so much more interesting. George very readily consented for your boy is always ready for anything that makes him of importance. The room was soon filled with a motley assemblage, from the old gray-headed patriarch of eighty to the young girl and lad of fifteen. A little harmless gossip ensued on various themes, such as where old Aunt Sally got her new red headkerchief, and how Mrs. was going to give Lizzie that spotted muslin gown when she got her new barrage made up and how Massa Shelby was thinking of buying a new sorrel colt that was going to prove an addition to the glories of the place. A few of the worshippers belonged to families hard by, who had got permission to attend, and who brought in various choice scraps of information about the sayings and doings at the house and on the place, which circulated as freely as the same sort of small change does in higher circles. After a while the singing commenced, to the evident delight of all present. Not even all the disadvantage of nasal intonation could prevent the effect of the naturally fine voices in airs at once wild and spirited. The words were sometimes the well-known and common hymns sung in the churches about, and sometimes of a wilder, more indefinite character, picked up at camp-meetings. The chorus of one of them, which ran as follows, was sung with great energy and unction. Die on the field of battle! die on the field of battle, glory in my soul. Another special favorite had oft repeated the words, Oh, I'm going to glory, won't you come along with me? Don't you see the angels beckoning and calling me away? Don't you see the golden city and the everlasting day? There were others which made incessant mention of Jordan's banks and Canaan's fields and the new Jerusalem, for the negro mind, impassioned and imaginative, always attaches itself to hymns and expressions of a vivid and pictorial nature. And as they sung, some laughed, and some cried, and some clapped hands, or shook hands rejoicingly with each other, as if they had fairly gained the other side of the river. Various exhortations, or relations of experience, followed, and intermingled with the singing. One old gray-headed woman, long past work, but much revered as a sort of chronicle of the past, rose, and leaning on her staff, said, "'Well, chillin, well, I'm mighty glad to hear y'all, and see y'all once more, cause I don't know when I'll be gone to glory, but I've done got ready, chillin. Pears like I'd got my little bundle all tied up and my bonnet on, just a waitin' for the stage to come long and take me home. Sometimes in the night, I think I hear the wheels a rattling, and I'm looking out all the time. Now you just be ready too, for I tell you all, chillin, she said, striking her staff hard on the floor. Dat our glory is a mighty thing. It's a mighty thing, chillin. You don't know nothing about it. It's wonderful. And the old creature sat down with streaming tears, as wholly overcome while the whole circle struck up. O oh, Canaan, bright Canaan, I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Massa George, by request, read the last chapters of Revelation, often interrupted by such exclamations as, The sakes now! Only hear that! Just think, aunt! Is all that a coming sure enough? George, who was a bright boy and well trained in religious things by his mother, 
finding himself an object of general admiration, threw in expositions of his own from time to time, with a commendable seriousness and gravity, for which he was admired by the young and blessed by the old, and it was agreed on all hands that a minister couldn't lay it off better than he did. That was really mazin'. Uncle Tom was a sort of patriarch in religious matters in the neighborhood, having naturally an organization in which the morale was strongly predominant, together with a greater breadth and cultivation of mind than obtained among his companions, he was looked up to with great respect as a sort of minister among them. And the simple, hearty, sincere style of his exhortations might have edified even better educated persons but it was in prayer that he especially excelled. Nothing could exceed the touching simplicity, the childlike earnestness of his prayer, enriched with the language of Scripture, which seemed so entirely to have wrought itself into his being as to have become a part of himself, and to drop from his lips unconsciously. In the language of a pious old negro he prayed right up, and so much did his prayer always work on the devotional feelings of his audiences that there seemed often a danger that it would be lost altogether in the abundance of the responses which broke out everywhere around him. While this scene was passing in the cabin of the man, one quite otherwise passed in the halls of the master. The trader and Mr. Shelby were seated together in the dining-room aforenamed, at a table covered with papers and writing utensils. Mr. Shelby was busy in counting some bundles of bills which, as they were counted, he pushed over to the trader, who counted them likewise. "'All fair,' said the trader. "'And now for signing these, er—' Mr. Shelby hastily drew the bills of sale toward him, and signed them, like a man that hurries over some disagreeable business, and then pushed them over with the money. Haley produced from a well-worn valise a parchment, which, after looking over it a moment, he handed to Mr. Shelby, who took it with a gesture of suppressed eagerness. "'Well, now, the thing's done,' said the trader, getting up. "'It's done,' said Mr. Shelby, in a musing tone, and fetching a long breath, repeated, "'It's done.' "'You don't seem to feel much pleased with it, appears to me,' said the trader. "'Haley,' said Mr. Shelby, "'I hope you'll remember that you promised on your honor you wouldn't sell Tom without knowing what sort of hands he's going into.' "'Why, you's just done it, sir,' said the trader. "'Circumstances, you well know, obliged me,' said Shelby haughtily. "'Well, you know, they may oblige me, too,' said the trader. "'Howsomever, I'll do the very best I can in getting Tom a good berth. As to my treatin' on him bad, you needn't be a grain feared. If there's anything that I thank the Lord for, it is that I'm never no ways cruel.' After the expositions which the trader had previously given of his humane principles, Mr. Shelby did not feel particularly reassured by these declarations, but as they were the best comfort the case admitted of, he allowed the trader to depart in silence, and betook himself to a solitary cigar. End of chapter 4 Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 5 Showing the Feelings of Living Property on Changing Owners Mr. and Mrs. Shelby had retired to their apartment for the night. He was lounging in a large easy-chair, looking over some letters that had come in the afternoon mail, and she was standing before her mirror, brushing out the complicated braids and curls in which Eliza had arranged her hair. For noticing her pale cheeks and haggard eyes, she had excused her attendance that night, and ordered her to bed. The employment, naturally enough, suggested her conversation with the girl in the morning, and turning to her husband she said carelessly, "'By the by, Arthur, who was that low-bred fellow that you lugged in to our dinner-table to-day?' "'Haley is his name,' said Shelby, turning himself rather uneasily in his chair, and continuing with his eyes fixed on a letter. "'Haley! Who is he? And what may be his business here, pray?' "'Well, he's a man that I transacted some business with last time I was at Natchez,' said Mr. Shelby." and he presumed on it to make himself quite at home, and call and dine here, eh?" "'Why, I invited him. I had some accounts with him,' said Shelby. "'Is he a negro trader?' said Mrs. Shelby, noticing a certain embarrassment in her husband's manner. "'Why, my dear, what put that into your head?' said Shelby, looking up. 
"'Nothing. Only Eliza came in here, after dinner, in a great worry, crying and taking on, and said you were talking with a trader, and that she heard him make an offer for her boy, the ridiculous little goose.' "'She did, hey?' said Mr. Shelby, returning to his paper, which he seemed for a few moments quite intent upon, not perceiving that he was holding it bottom upwards. "'It will have to come out,' said he mentally, "'as well now as ever.' "'I told Eliza,' said Mrs. Shelby, as she continued brushing her hair, "'that she was a little fool for her pains, and that you never had anything to do with that sort of persons. Of course, I knew you never meant to sell any of our people, least of all to such a fellow.' "'Well, Emily,' said her husband, "'so I have always felt and said. But the fact is that my business lies so that I cannot get on without. I shall have to sell some of my hands.' "'To that creature? Impossible! Mr. Shelby, you cannot be serious!' "'I'm sorry to say that I am,' said Mr. Shelby. "'I've agreed to sell Tom.' "'What? Our Tom? That good, faithful creature? Been your faithful servant from a boy. Oh, Mr. Shelby, and you have promised him his freedom, too. You and I have spoken to him a hundred times of it. Well, I can believe anything now. I can believe now that you could sell little Harry, poor Eliza's only child," said Mrs. Shelby, in a tone between grief and indignation. "'Well, since you must know all, it is so. I have agreed to sell Tom and Harry both, and I don't know why I am to be rated as if I were a monster for doing what every one does every day. But why of all others choose these?" said Mrs. Shelby. Why sell them, of all on the place, if you must sell it all? Because they will bring the highest sum of any, that's why. I could choose another, if you say so. The fellow made me a high bid on Eliza, if that would suit you any better," said Mr. Shelby. "'The wretch!' said Mrs. Shelby vehemently. "'Well, I didn't listen to it a moment. Out of regard to your feelings, I wouldn't. So give me some credit. My dear! said Mrs. Shelby, recollecting herself. Forgive me. I have been hasty. I was surprised and entirely unprepared for this. But surely you will allow me to intercede for these poor creatures. Tom is a noble-hearted, faithful fellow, if he is black. I do believe, Mr. Shelby, that if he were put to it, he would lay down his life for you. I know it, I dare say. But what's the use of all this? I can't help myself. Why not make a pecuniary sacrifice? I'm willing to bear my part of the inconvenience. Oh, Mr. Shelby, I have tried, tried most faithfully, as a Christian woman should, to do my duty to these poor, simple, dependent creatures. I have cared for them, instructed them, watched over them, and know all their little cares and joys for years. And how can I ever hold up my head again among them, if, for the sake of a little paltry gain, we sell such a faithful, excellent, confiding creature as poor Tom, and tear from him in a moment all we have taught him to love and value. I have taught them the duties of the family, of parent and child, and husband and wife, and how can I bear to have this open acknowledgment that we care for no tie, no duty, no relation, however sacred compared with money? I have talked with Eliza about her boy, her duty to him as a Christian mother, to watch over him, pray for him, and bring him up in a Christian way. And now what can I say if you tear him away and sell him, soul and body, to a profane, unprincipled man, just to save a little money? I have told her that one soul is worth more than all the money in the world. And how will she believe me when she sees us turn round and sell her child? Sell him, perhaps, to certain ruin of body and soul." "'I'm sorry you feel so about it. Indeed I am,' said Mr. Shelby. "'And I respect your feelings, too though I don't pretend to share them to their full extent. But I tell you now, solemnly, it's of no use. I can't help myself. I didn't mean to tell you this, Emily, but in plain words there is no choice between selling these two and selling everything. Either they must go, or all must. Haley has come into possession of a mortgage, which, if I don't clear off with him directly, will take everything before it. I've raked and scraped and borrowed, and all but begged, and the price of these two was needed to make up the balance, and I had to give them up. Haley fancied the child. He agreed to settle the matter that way, and no other. 
I was in his power, and had to do it. If you feel so to have them sold, would it be any better to have all sold?" Mrs. Shelby stood like one stricken. Finally, turning to her toilet, she rested her face in her hands, and gave a sort of groan. "'This is God's curse on slavery, a bitter, bitter, most accursed thing, a curse to the master and a curse to the slave. I was a fool to think I could make anything good out of such a deadly evil. It is a sin to hold a slave under laws like ours. I always felt it was. I always thought so when I was a girl. I thought so still more after I joined the church. But I thought I could gild it over. I thought by kindness and care and instruction I could make the condition of mine better than freedom. Fool that I was! Why, wife, you are getting to be an abolitionist quite. Abolitionist! If they knew all I know about slavery, they might talk. We don't need them to tell us. You know I never thought that slavery was right, never felt willing to own slaves." "'Well, therein you differ from many wise and pious men,' said Mr. Shelby. You remember Mr. B.'s sermon the other Sunday?" "'I don't want to hear such sermons. I never wish to hear Mr. B. in our church again. Ministers can't help the evil, perhaps, can't cure it any more than we can but defend it. It always went against my common sense. And I think you didn't think much of that sermon, either." Well, said Shelby, I must say these ministers sometimes carry matters further than we poor sinners would exactly dare to do. We men of the world must wink pretty hard at various things, and get used to a deal that isn't the exact thing. But we don't quite fancy when women and ministers come out broad and square and go beyond us in matters of either modesty or morals, that's a fact. But now, my dear, I trust you see the necessity of the thing, and you see that I have done the very best that circumstances would allow." "'Oh, yes, yes,' said Mrs. Shelby, hurriedly and abstractedly fingering her gold watch. "'I haven't any jewellery of any amount,' she added thoughtfully. "'But would not this watch do something? It was an expensive one, when it was bought. If I could only at least save Eliza's child, I would sacrifice anything I have." "'I'm sorry, very sorry, Emily,' said Mr. Shelby. "'I'm sorry this takes hold of you so, but it will do no good. The fact is, Emily, the thing's done. The bills of sale are already signed, and in Haley's hands, and you must be thankful it is no worse. That man has had it in his power to ruin us all, and now he is fairly off. If you knew the man as I do, you'd think that we had had a narrow escape." "'Is he so hard, then?' "'Why, not a cruel man, exactly, but a man of leather, a man alive to nothing but trade and profit, cool and unhesitating and unrelenting as death and the grave. He'd sell his own mother at a good percentage, not wishing the old woman any harm, either. "'And this wretch owns that good, faithful Tom and Eliza's child?' Well, my dear, the fact is that this goes rather hard with me. It's a thing I hate to think of. Haley wants to drive matters, and take possession to-morrow. I'm going to get out my horse bright and early and be off. I can't see Tom, that's a fact, and you had better arrange a drive somewhere, and carry Eliza off. Let the thing be done when she is out of sight." "'No, no,' said Mrs. Shelby. I'll be in no sense accomplice or help in this cruel business. I'll go and see poor old Tom, God help him, in his distress. They shall see, at any rate, that their mistress can feel for and with them. As to Eliza, I dare not think about it. The Lord forgive us. What have we done that this cruel necessity should come on us?" There was one listener to this conversation whom Mr. and Mrs. Shelby little suspected. Communicating with their apartment was a large closet, opening by a door into an outer passage. When Mrs. Shelby had dismissed Eliza for the night, her feverish and excited mind had suggested the idea of his closet, and she had hidden herself there, and with her ear pressed close against the crack of the door, had lost not a word of the conversation. When the voices died into silence, she rose and crept stealthily away, pale, shivering, with rigid features and compressed lips. She looked an entirely altered being from the soft and timid creature she had been hitherto. She moved cautiously along the entry, paused one moment at her mistress's door, and raised her hands in mute appeal to heaven, and then turned and glided into her own room. 
It was a quiet, neat apartment on the same floor with her mistress. There was a pleasant sunny window where she had often sat singing at her sewing. There a little case of books, and various little fancy articles, ranged by them, the gifts of Christmas holidays. There was her simple wardrobe in the closet, and in the drawers. Here was, in short, her home, and on the whole a happy one it had been to her. But there, on the bed, lay her slumbering boy, his long curls falling negligently around his unconscious face, his rosy mouth half open, his little fat hands thrown out over the bedclothes, and a smile spread like a sunbeam over his whole face. "'Poor boy, poor fellow,' said Eliza. "'They have sold you, but your mother will save you yet.' No tear dropped over that pillow. In such straits as these, the heart has no tears to give. It drops only blood, bleeding itself away in silence. She took a piece of paper and a pencil and wrote hastily, "'Oh, Mrs., dear Mrs., don't think me ungrateful. Don't think hard of me, anyway. I heard all you and Master said to-night. I am going to try to save my boy. You will not blame me. God bless and reward you for all your kindness.' Hastily folding and directing this, she went to a drawer and made up a little package of clothing for her boy, which she tied with a handkerchief firmly around her waist. And so fond is a mother's remembrance that, even in the terrors of that hour, she did not forget to put in the little package one or two of his favorite toys, reserving a gaily painted parrot to amuse him, when she should be called on to awaken him. It was some trouble to arouse the little sleeper, but after some effort he sat up, and was playing with his bird while his mother was putting on her bonnet and shawl. "'Where are you going, mother?' said he, as she drew near the bed with his little coat and cap. His mother drew near, and looked so earnestly into his eyes, that he at once divined that something unusual was the matter. "'Hush, Harry,' she said. "'Mustn't speak loud, or they will hear us. A wicked man was coming to take little Harry away from his mother, and carry him way off in the dark, but mother won't let him.' She's going to put on her little boy's cap and coat and run off with him so the ugly man can't catch him." Saying these words, she had tied and buttoned on the child's simple outfit, and, taking him in her arms, she whispered to him to be very still, and, opening a door in her room which led into the outer veranda, she glided noiselessly out. It was a sparkling, frosty, starlight night and the mother wrapped the shawl close around her child, as, perfectly quiet with vague terror, he clung round her neck. Old Bruno, a great Newfoundland, who slept at the end of the porch, rose with a low growl as she came near. She gently spoke his name, and the animal, an old pet and playmate of hers, instantly wagging his tail, prepared to follow her, though apparently revolving much, in this simple dog's head, what such an indiscreet midnight promenade might mean. Some dim ideas of imprudence or impropriety in the measure seemed to embarrass him considerably, for he often stopped as Eliza glided forward, and looked wistfully, first at her and then at the house, and then, as if reassured by reflection, he pattered along after her again. A few minutes brought them to the window of Uncle Tom's cottage, and Eliza, stopping, tapped lightly on the window-pane. The prayer-meeting at Uncle Tom's had, in the order of hymn-singing, been protracted to a very late hour, and, as Uncle Tom had indulged himself in a few lengthy solos afterwards, the consequence was that, although it was now between twelve and one o'clock, he and his worthy helpmeet were not yet asleep. "'Good Lord, what's that?' said Aunt Chloe, starting up and hastily drawing the curtain. "'My sake's alive, if it ain't Lizzie! Get on your clothes, old man, quick! There's old Bruno, too, a pawing around. What on earth! I'm going to open the door." And suiting the action to the word, the door flew open and the light of the tallow candle, which Tom had hastily lighted, fell on the haggard face and dark, wild eyes of the fugitive. "'Lord bless you! I'm scared to look at you, Lizzie. Are you tuck sick, or what's come over you?' "'I'm running away, Uncle Tom and Aunt Chloe, carrying off my child. Master sold him.' "'Sold him?' echoed both, lifting up their hands in dismay. "'Yes, sold him,' said Eliza firmly. I crept into the closet by mistress's door to-night, and I heard master tell missus that he had sold my Harry, and you, Uncle Tom, both, to a trader, and that he was going off this morning on his horse, and that the man was to take possession to-day." Tom had stood, during this speech, with his hands raised, and his eyes dilated like a man in a dream. Slowly and gradually, 
As its meaning came over him, he collapsed rather than seated himself on his old chair, and sunk his head down upon his knees. "'The good Lord have pity on us,' said Aunt Chloe. "'Oh, it don't seem as if it was true. But what has he done that Master should sell him?' "'He hasn't done anything. It isn't for that. Master don't want to sell, and Mrs. she's always good. I heard her plead and beg for us, but he told her it was no use, that he was in this man's debt, and that this man had got the power over him, and that if he didn't pay him off clear, it would end in his having to sell the place and all the people and move off. Yes, I heard him say there was no choice between selling these two and selling all. The man was driving him so hard. Master said he was sorry, but, oh, Mrs., you ought to have heard her talk. If she ain't a Christian and an angel, there never was one. I'm a wicked girl to leave her so, but then I can't help it. She said herself one soul was worth more than the world, and this boy has a soul, and if I let him be carried off, who knows what'll become of it. It must be right, but if it ain't right, the Lord forgive me, for I can't help doing it. "'Well, old man,' said Aunt Chloe, "'why don't you go, too? Will you wait to be toted down the river where they kill niggers with hard work and starving? I'd a heap rather die than go there any day. There's time for you. Be off with Lizzie. You've got a pass to come and go any time. Come, bustle up, and, and I'll get your things together.' Tom slowly raised his head, and looked sorrowfully but quietly around, and said, "'No, no, I ain't going. Let Eliza go. It's her right. I wouldn't be the one to say no.' Tain't in nature for her to stay. But you heard what she said. If I must be sold, or all the people on the place and everything go to rack, why, let me be sold. I suppose I can buy it as well as any of them, he added, while something like a sob and a sigh shook his broad, rough chest convulsively. Master always found me on the spot. He always will. I never have broke trust, nor used my past no ways contrary to my word, and I never will. It's better for me alone to go than to break up the place and sell all. Master ain't to blame, Chloe, and he'll take care of you and the poor. Here he turned to the rough trundle bed full of little woolly heads and broke fairly down. He leaned over the back of the chair and covered his face with his large hands. Sobs, heavy, hoarse and loud, shook the chair, and great tears fell through his fingers on the floor. Just such tears, sir, as you dropped into the coffin where lay your first-born son. Such tears, woman, as you shed when you heard the cries of your dying babe. For, sir, he was a man, and you are but another man. And woman, though dressed in silk and jewels, you are but a woman. And in life's great straits and mighty griefs, you feel but one sorrow. And now, said Eliza, as she stood in the door, I saw my husband only this afternoon, and I little knew then what was to come. They have pushed him to the very last standing place, and he told me to-day that he was going to run away. Do try, if you can, to get word to him. Tell him how I went, and why I went, and tell him I'm going to try and find Canada. You must give my love to him, and tell him, if I never see him again, she turned away, and stood with her back to them for a moment, and then added in a husky voice, Tell him to be as good as he can and try and meet me in the kingdom of heaven. Call Bruno in there, she added. Shut the door on him, poor beast. He mustn't go with me. A few last words and tears, a few simple adieus and blessings, and clasping her wondering and affrighted child in her arms, she glided noiselessly away. End of chapter 5 Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter 6 Discovery. Mr. and Mrs. Shelby, after their protracted discussion of the night before, did not readily sink to repose, and, in consequence, slept somewhat later than usual the ensuing morning. "'I wonder what keeps Eliza,' said Mrs. Shelby, after giving her bell repeated pulls to no purpose. Mr. Shelby was standing before his dressing-glass, sharpening his razor, and just then the door opened, and a colored boy entered with his shaving-water. "'Andy,' said his mistress, "'step to Eliza's door and tell her I have rung for her three times. Poor thing!' she added to herself with a sigh. Andy soon returned, with eyes very wide in astonishment. "'Lor, Missus, Lizzie's drawers all open, and her things all lying every which way, and I believe she's done cleared out!' The truth flashed upon Mr. Shelby and his wife at the same moment. He exclaimed, 
Then she suspected it, and she's off. The Lord be thanked, said Mrs. Shelby. I trust she is. Wife, you talk like a fool. Really, it will be something pretty awkward for me if she is. Haley saw that I hesitated about selling this child, and he'll think I connived at it to get him out of the way. It touches my honor. And Mr. Shelby left the room hastily. There was great running and ejaculating, and opening and shutting of doors, and appearance of faces in all shades of color in different places, for about a quarter of an hour. One person only, who might have shed some light on the matter, was entirely silent, and that was the head cook, Aunt Chloe. Silently, and with a heavy cloud settled down over her once joyous face, she proceeded making out her breakfast biscuits, as if she heard and saw nothing of the excitement around her. Very soon about a dozen young imps were roosting, like so many crows, on the veranda railings, each one determined to be the first one to apprise the strange master of his ill luck. "'He'll be rao mad, I'll be bound,' said Andy. "'Won't he swar?' said little black Jake. "'Yes, for he does swar,' said woolly-headed Mandy. "'And I hearn him yesterday at dinner. I hearn him all about it, cause I got it into the closet where missus keeps the great jugs, and I hearn every word.' And Mandy, who had never in her life thought of the meaning of a word she had heard more than a black cat, now took airs of superior wisdom, and strutted about forgetting to state that, though actually coiled up among the jugs at the time specified, she had been fast asleep all the time. When, at last, Haley appeared, hooted and spurred, he was saluted with the bad tidings on every hand. The young imps on the veranda were not disappointed in their hope of hearing him swar, which he did with a fluency and fervency which delighted them all amazingly, as they ducked and dodged hither and thither to be out of the reach of his riding whip, and all whooping off together they tumbled in a pile of immeasurable giggle on the withered turf under the veranda, where they kicked up their heels and shouted to their full satisfaction. "'If I had the little devils!' muttered Haley between his teeth. "'But you hain't got them, though,' said Andy, with a triumphant flourish, and making a string of indescribable mouths at the unfortunate trader's back, when he was fairly beyond hearing. "'I say now, Shelby, this year's a most extraordinary business,' said Haley, as he abruptly entered the parlor. "'It seems that gal's off with her young'un.' "'Mr. Haley, Mrs. Shelby is present,' said Mr. Shelby. "'I beg pardon, ma'am,' said Haley, bowing slightly, with a still lowering brow. But still I say, as I said before, this year's a singular report. Is it true, sir? Sir, said Mr. Shelby, if you wish to communicate with me, you must observe something of the decorum of a gentleman. Andy, take Mr. Haley's hat and riding whip. Take a seat, sir. Yes, sir, I regret to say that the young woman, excited by overhearing or having reported to her something of this business, has taken her child in the night and made off. "'I did expect fair dealing in this matter, I confess,' said Haley. "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Shelby, turning sharply round upon him, "'what am I to understand by that remark? "'If any man calls my honor in question, I have but one answer for him.' The trader cowered at this, and in a somewhat lower tone said that "'It was plaguy hard on a fellow that had made a fair bargain to be gulled that way. "'Mr. Haley,' said Mr. Shelby, "'if I did not think you had some cause for disappointment, I should not have borne from you the rude and unceremonious style of your entrance into my parlour this morning. I say thus much, however, since appearances call for it, that I shall allow of no insinuations cast upon me, as if I were at all partner to any unfairness in this matter. Moreover, I shall feel bound to give you every assistance in the use of horses, servants, etc., in the recovery of your property. So, in short, Haley, said he, suddenly dropping from the tone of dignified coolness, to his ordinary one of easy frankness. The best way for you is to keep good-natured, and eat some breakfast, and we will then see what is to be done." Mrs. Shelby now rose, and said her engagements would prevent her being at the breakfast-table that morning, and deputing a very respectable mulatto woman to attend to the gentleman's coffee at the sideboard, she left the room. "'Old lady don't like your humble servant, over and above,' said Haley, with an uneasy effort to be very familiar. I am not accustomed to hear my wife spoken of with such freedom," said Mr. Shelby dryly. "'Beg pardon. Of course, only a joke, you know,' said Haley, forcing a laugh. "'Some jokes are less agreeable than others,' rejoined Shelby. "'Devilish free, now I've signed those papers, cuss him,' muttered Haley to himself. 
quite grand since yesterday. Never did fall of any prime minister at court occasion wider surges of sensation than the report of Tom's fate among his compeers on the place. It was the topic in every mouth, everywhere, and nothing was done in the house or in the field but to discuss its probable results. Eliza's flight, an unprecedented event on the place, was also a great accessory in stimulating the general excitement. Black Sam, as he was commonly called, from his being about three shades blacker than any other son of ebony on the place, was revolving the matter profoundly in all its phases and bearings, with a comprehensiveness of vision and a strict lookout to his own personal well-being that would have done credit to any white patriot in Washington. "'It's an ill wind that blow nowhere, that our fact,' said Sam, sententiously, giving an additional hoist to his pantaloons, and adroitly substituting a long nail in place of a missing suspender-button, with which effort of mechanical genius he seemed highly delighted. "'Yes, it's an ill wind blows nowhere,' he repeated. "'Now, dar, Tom's down, while, course, there's room for some nigger to be up. And why not this nigger? That's the idea. Tom, riding round the country, boots blacked, pass in his pocket, all grand as cuffy, but who he? Now, why shouldn't Sam? That's what I want to know. "'Hallo, Sam! Oh, Sam! Masters wants you to coach Bill and Jerry,' said Andy, cutting short Sam's soliloquy. "'Hi! What's the foot now, young un?' "'Why, you don't know, I suppose, that Lizzie's cut stick and clared out with her young un.' "'You teach your granny,' said Sam, with infinite contempt. "'Noted a heap sight sooner than you did. This nigger ain't so green now.' "'Well, anyhow, Massa wants Bill and Jerry geared right up, and you and I's to go with Massa Haley to look out to her.' "'Good now. That's the time of day,' said Sam. "'It's Sam that's called for in these here times. He's the nigger.' See if I don't cotch her now. Master'll see what Sam can do. Ah, but Sam, said Andy, you'd better think twice, for Missus don't want her cotched, and she'll be in your wool. Hi, said Sam, opening his eyes. How you know dat? Heard her say so, my own self, this blessed morning when I bring in Master's shaving water. She sent me to see why Lizzie didn't come to dress her, and when I told her she was off, she just ras up and says she, the Lord be praised. And Master, he seemed rail mad, and says he, "Wife, you talk like a fool." But Lord, she'll bring him too. I knows well enough how that'll be. It's allers best to stand Missus side the fence. Now I tell you, Black Sam, upon this, scratched his woolly pate, which, if it did not contain very profound wisdom, still contained a great deal of a particular species much in demand among politicians of all complexions and countries, and vulgarly denominated knowing which side the bread is buttered. So, stopping with grave consideration, he again gave a hitch to his pantaloons, which was his regularly organized method of assisting his mental perplexities. "'There ain't no saying, never, about no kind of thing in dis yer world,' he said at last. Sam spoke like a philosopher, emphasizing this, as if he had had a large experience in different sorts of worlds, and therefore had come to his conclusions advisedly. "'Now, certain I'd a said that Missus would a scoured the varsal world after Lizzie," added Sam thoughtfully. "'So she would,' said Andy. "'But can't you see through the ladder, you black nigger? Missus don't want this yer Massa Haley to get Lizzie's boy. That's to go.' "'Hi,' said Sam, with an indescribable intonation known only to those who have heard it among the negroes. "'I'll tell you more and all,' said Andy. "'I specs you'd better be making tracks for dem horses mighty sudden, too, for I hear Missus quiring arter yer. So you stood foolin' long enough." Sam, upon this, began to bestir himself in real earnest, and after a while appeared bearing down gloriously toward the house, with Bill and Jerry in full canter, and adroitly throwing himself off before they had had any idea of stopping, he brought them up alongside of the horse-post like a tornado. Haley's horse, which was a skittish young colt, winced and bounced, and pulled hard at his halter. "'Ho, ho!' said Sam. "'Skeery, are you?' and his black visage lighted up with a curious mischievous gleam. "'I'll fix you now,' said he. There was a large beech-tree overshadowing the place, and the small, sharp, triangular beech-nuts lay scattered thickly on the ground. With one of these in his fingers, Sam approached the colt, stroked and patted, and seemed apparently busy in soothing his agitation. On pretense of adjusting the saddle, he adroitly slipped under the sharp little nut, in such a manner that the least weight brought upon the saddle 
would annoy the nervous sensibilities of the animal, without leaving any perceptible graze or wound. Dar, he said, rolling his eyes with an approving grin. Me fix em. At this moment Mrs. Shelby appeared on the balcony, beckoning to him. Sam approached with as good a determination to pay court as did ever suit her after a vacant place at St. James or Washington. "'Why have you been loitering so, Sam? I sent Andy to tell you to hurry.' "'Lord bless you, Missus,' said Sam. "'Horses won't be cotched all in a minute. They done clared out way down to the south pasture, and the Lord knows why. "'Sam, how often must I tell you not to say Lord bless you and the Lord knows and such things? It's wicked.' "'Oh, Lord bless my soul! I done forgot, Missus. I won't say nothing of the sort no more. Why, Sam, you just have said it again. Did I? Oh, Lord! I mean, I, I didn't go for to say it. You must be careful, Sam. Just let me get my breath, Missus, and I'll start fair. I'll be very careful. Well, Sam, you are to go with Mr. Haley to show him the road and help him. Be careful to the horses, Sam. You know Jerry was a little lame last week. Don't ride them too fast. Mrs. Shelby spoke the last words with a low voice and strong emphasis. Let this child alone for dat, said Sam, rolling up his eye with a volume of meaning. Lord knows. Hi, didn't I say dat? said he, suddenly catching his breath with a ludicrous flourish of apprehension which made his mistress laugh, spite herself. Yes, Missus, I'll look out for the horses. Now, Andy, said Sam, returning to his stand under the beech trees, you see, I wouldn't be tall surprised if dat our gentleman critter should give a fling by and by when he comes to be getting up. You know, Andy, critters will do such things. And therewith Sam poked Andy in the side in a highly suggestive manner. Hi, said Andy, with an air of instant appreciation. Yes, you see, Andy, Missus wants to make time. Dad ours clear to their most ordinary observer. I just make a little for her. Now, you see, get all these dare horses loose, carpern permiscus, round this yer lot and down to the wood dar. And I spec Masser'll won't be off in a hurry. Andy grinned. You see, said Sam, you see, Andy, if any such thing should happen as that Master Haley's horse should begin to act contrary and cut up, you and I just let's go arn to help him, and we'll help him, oh yes. And Sam and Andy laid their heads back on their shoulders and broke into a low, immoderate laugh, snapping their fingers and flourishing their heels with exquisite delight. At this instant Haley appeared on the veranda, somewhat mollified by certain cups of very good coffee. He came out smiling and talking in tolerably restored humor. Sam and Andy, clawing for certain fragmentary palm-leaves, which they were in the habit of considering as hats, flew to the horse-posts to be ready to help Masser. Sam's palm-leaf had been ingeniously disentangled from all pretensions to braid, as respects its brim, and the slivers starting apart and standing upright gave it a blazing air of freedom and defiance quite equal to that of any Fiji chief while the whole brim of Andy's being departed bodily, he wrapped the crown on his head with a dexterous thump, and looked about well pleased, as if to say, "'Who says I haven't got a hat?' "'Well, boys,' said Haley, "'look alive now. We must lose no time.' "'Not a bit of him, Masser,' said Sam, putting Haley's rein in his hand, and holding his stirrup, while Andy was untying the other two horses. The instant Haley touched the saddle, the mettlesome creature bounded from the earth with a sudden spring that threw his master sprawling some feet off on the soft, dry turf. Sam, with frantic ejaculations, made a dive at the reins, but only succeeded in brushing the blazing palm-leaf aforenamed into the horse's eyes, which by no means tended to allay the confusion of his nerves. So with great vehemence he overturned Sam, and giving two or three contemptuous snorts, flourished his heels vigorously in the air and was soon prancing away towards the lower end of the lawn, followed by Bill and Jerry, whom Andy had not failed to let loose according to contract, speeding them off with various direful ejaculations. And now ensued a miscellaneous scene of confusion. Sam and Andy ran and shouted, dogs barked here and there, and Mike, Mose, Mandy, Fanny, and all the smaller specimens on the place, both male and female, raced, clapped hands, whooped, and shouted, with outrageous officiousness and untiring zeal. Haley's horse, which was a white one, and very fleet and spirited, appeared to enter into the spirit of the scene with great gusto, and having for his coursing ground a lawn of nearly half a mile in extent, 
gently sloping down on every side into indefinite woodland, he appeared to take infinite delight in seeing how near he could allow his pursuers to approach him, and then, when within a hand's breadth, whisk off with a start and a snort, like a mischievous beast as he was, and career far down into some alley of the woodlot. Nothing was further from Sam's mind than to have any one of the troop taken until such season as should seem to him most befitting, and the exertions that he made were certainly most heroic, like the sword of Coeur de Lion, which always blazed in the front and thickest of the battle. Sam's palm-leaf was to be seen everywhere when there was the least danger that a horse could be caught. There he would bear down full tilt, shouting, "'Now for it! Cotch him! Cotch him!' in a way that would set everything to indiscriminate rout in a moment. Haley ran up and down, and cursed and swore and stamped miscellaneously. Mr. Shelby in vain tried to shout directions from the balcony, and Mrs. Shelby from her chamber window alternately laughed and wondered, not without some inkling of what lay at the bottom of all this confusion. At last, about twelve o'clock, Sam appeared triumphant, mounted on Jerry, with Haley's horse by his side, reeking with sweat, but with flashing eyes and dilated nostrils, showing that the spirit of freedom had not yet entirely subsided. "'He's cotched!' he exclaimed triumphantly. "'If it hadn't been for me, they might have bust themselves all on em. But I cotched em. "'You,' growled Haley, in an amiable mood, "'if it hadn't been for you, this never would have happened.' "'Lord bless us, Massa," said Sam, in a tone of the deepest concern, "'and me that has been racing and chasing till the sweat just pours off me. "'Well, well,' said Haley, "'you've lost me near three hours with your cursed nonsense. Now let's be off, and have no more foolin'. "'Why, Massa," said Sam, in a deprecating tone, "'I believe you mean to kill us all clar, horses and all. Here we are all just ready to drop down, and, and the critters all in a reek of sweat. Why, uh, Massa won't think of startin' on now till arter dinner. Massa Hoss wants rubbin' down. See how he splashed himself? And Jerry limps, too. Don't think Missus would be willin' to have a start dis yar way, no how. Lord bless you, Massa. We can catch up, if we do stop. Lizzie never was no great of a walker. Mrs. Shelby, who, greatly to her amusement, had overheard this conversation from the veranda, now resolved to do her part. She came forward, and, courteously expressing her concern for Haley's accident, pressed him to stay to dinner, saying that the cook should bring it on the table immediately. Thus, all things considered, Haley, with rather an equivocal grace, proceeded to the parlour, while Sam, rolling his eyes after him with unutterable meaning, proceeded gravely with the horses to the stable-yard. "'Did you see him, Andy? Did you see him?' said Sam, when he had got fairly beyond the shelter of the barn, and fastened the horse to a post. "'Oh, Lord, if it wasn't as good as a meetin' now, to see him a-dancin' and kickin' and swarin' at us! Didn't I hear him? Swar away, old fellow, says I to myself. Will you have your hoss now, or wait till you cotch him? Says I, Lord, Andy, I think I can see him now. And Sam and Andy leaned up against the barn and laughed to their hearts' content. Your oughter seen how mad he looked when I brought his hoss up. Lord, he killed me if he durst to. And there I was a standin' as innocent and as humble. Lord, I seed you, said Andy. Ain't you an old hoss, Sam? Rather specs I am, said Sam. Did you see Missus upstairs at the winder? I seed her laughin'. I'm sure I was racin', so I didn't see nothin', said Andy. Well, you see, said Sam, proceeding gravely to wash down Haley's pony, I's quired what yer may call a habit of observation, Andy. It's a very important habit, Andy, and I command yer to be cultivatin' it now yer young. I stepped that hind foot, Andy. You see, Andy, it's observation makes all difference in niggers. Didn't I see which way the wind blew this year morning? Didn't I see what Miss wanted, though she never'd let on? That ours observation, Andy. I specs it's what you may call a faculty. Faculties is different in different peoples, but its cultivation on em goes a great way. I guess if I hadn't helped your observation this morning, you wouldn't a seen your way so smart, said Andy. Andy, said Sam, you's a promising child. There ain't no matter of doubt. I thinks lots of yer, Andy, and I don't feel no ways ashamed to take ideas from you. We oughtn't er overlook nobody, Andy, cause the smart o' us gets tripped up sometimes. And so, Andy, let's go up to the house now. I'll be bound Missus'll keep us an uncommon good bite this year time. End of chapter six. 
Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Chapter Seven, The Mother's Struggle. It is impossible to conceive of a human creature more wholly desolate and forlorn than Eliza when she turned her footsteps from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Her husband's suffering and dangers, and the danger of her child, all blended in her mind with a confused and stunning sense of the risk she was running in leaving the only home she had ever known and cutting loose from the protection of a friend whom she loved and revered. Then there was the parting from every familiar object, the place where she had grown up, the trees under which she had played, the groves where she had walked many an evening in happier days by the side of her young husband. Everything, as it lay in the clear, frosty starlight, seemed to speak reproachfully to her, and ask her whither could she go from a home like that. But stronger than all was maternal love, wrought into a paroxysm of frenzy by the near approach of a fearful danger. Her boy was old enough to have walked by her side, and in an indifferent case she would only have led him by the hand. But now the bare thought of putting him out of her arms made her shudder, and she strained him to her bosom with a convulsive grasp as she went rapidly forward. The frosty ground creaked beneath her feet, and she trembled at the sound. Every quaking leaf and fluttering shadow sent the blood backward to her heart and quickened her footsteps. She wondered within herself at the strength that seemed to be come upon her, for she felt the weight of her boy as if it had been a feather, and every flutter of fear seemed to increase the supernatural power that bore her on, while from her pale lips burst forth, in frequent ejaculations, the prayer to a friend above, "'Lord, help! Lord, save me!' "'If it were your Harry, mother, or your Willie, that were going to be torn from you by a brutal traitor to-morrow morning, if you had seen the man and heard that the papers were signed and delivered, and you had only from twelve o'clock till morning to make good your escape, how fast could you walk?' How many miles could you make in those few brief hours, with the darling at your bosom, the little sleepy head on your shoulder, the small soft arms trustingly holding on to your neck? For the child slept. At first the novelty and alarm kept him waking, but his mother so hurriedly repressed every breath or sound, and so assured him that if he were only still she would certainly save him, that he clung quietly round her neck, only asking— as he found himself sinking to sleep. "'Mother, I don't need to keep awake, do I?' "'No, my darling, sleep if you want to. But, mother, if I do get asleep, you won't let him get me.' "'No, so may God help me,' said his mother, with a paler cheek and a brighter light in her large dark eyes. "'You're sure, ain't you, mother?' "'Yes, sure,' said the mother, in a voice that startled herself for it seemed to her to come from a spirit within that was no part of her. And the boy dropped his little weary head on her shoulder, and was soon asleep. How the touch of those warm arms, the gentle breathings that came in her neck, seemed to add fire and spirit to her movements! It seemed to her as if strength poured into her in electric streams from every gentle touch and movement of the sleeping, confiding child. Sublime is the dominion of the mind over the body, that, for a time, can make flesh and nerve impregnable, and string the sinews like steel, so that the weak become so mighty. The boundaries of the farm, the grove, the woodlot, passed by her dizzily as she walked on, and still she went, leaving one familiar object after another, slacking not, pausing not, till reddening daylight found her many a long mile from all traces of any familiar objects upon the open highway. She had often been with her mistress to visit some connections in the little village of T, not far from the Ohio River, and knew the road well. To go thither, to escape across the Ohio River, were the first hurried outlines of her plan of escape. Beyond that she could only hope in God. When horses and vehicles began to move along the highway, with that alert perception peculiar to a state of excitement, and which seems to be a sort of inspiration, she became aware that her headlong pace and distracted air might bring on her remark and suspicion. She therefore put the boy on the ground, and, adjusting her dress and bonnet, she walked on at as rapid a pace as she thought consistent with the preservation of appearances. 
In her little bundle she had provided a store of cakes and apples, which she used as expedients for quickening the speed of the child, rolling the apple some yards before them, when the boy would run with all his might after it. And this ruse, often repeated, carried them over many a half-mile. After a while they came to a thick patch of woodland, through which murmured a clear brook. As the child complained of hunger and thirst, she climbed over the fence with him, and sitting down behind a large rock which concealed them from the road, she gave him a breakfast out of her little package. The boy wondered and grieved that she could not eat, and when, putting his arms round her neck, he tried to wedge some of his cake into her mouth, it seemed to her that the rising in her throat would choke her. "'No, no, Harry, darling. Mother can't eat till you are safe. We must go on, on, till we come to the river.' And she hurried again into the road, and again constrained herself to walk regularly and composedly forward. She was many miles past any neighborhood where she was personally known. If she should chance to meet any who knew her, she reflected that the well-known kindness of the family would be of itself a blind to suspicion, as making it an unlikely supposition that she could be a fugitive. As she was also so white as not to be known as of colored lineage without a critical survey, and her child was white also, it was much easier for her to pass on unsuspected. On this presumption she stopped at noon at a neat farmhouse to rest herself and buy some dinner for her child and self. For as the danger decreased with the distance, the supernatural tension of the nervous system lessened, and she found herself both weary and hungry. The good woman, kindly and gossiping, seemed rather pleased than otherwise with having somebody come in to talk with, and accepted, without examination, Eliza's statement that she was going on a little piece to spend a week with her friends, all which she hoped in her heart might prove strictly true. An hour before sunset she entered the village of T by the Ohio River, weary and footsore, but still strong in heart. Her first glance was at the river, which lay, like Jordan, between her and the Canaan of Liberty on the other side. It was now early spring, and the river was swollen and turbulent. Great cakes of floating ice were swinging heavily to and fro in the turbid waters. Owing to the peculiar form of the shore on the Kentucky side, the land bending far out into the water, the ice had been lodged and detained in great quantities, and the narrow channel which swept round the bend was full of ice, piled one cake over another, thus forming a temporary barrier to the descending ice, which lodged and formed a great undulating raft, filling up the whole river and extending almost to the Kentucky shore. Eliza stood for a moment, contemplating this unfavorable aspect of things, which she saw at once must prevent the usual ferry-boat from running, and then turned into a small public-house on the bank to make a few inquiries. The hostess, who was busy in various fizzing and stewing operations over the fire, preparatory to an evening meal, stopped, with a fork in her hand, as Eliza's sweet and plaintive voice arrested her. "'What is it?' she said. "'Isn't there any ferry or boat that takes people over to B now?' she said. "'No, indeed,' said the woman. "'The boats have stopped running.' Eliza's look of dismay and disappointment struck the woman, and she said inquiringly, "'Maybe you're wanting to get over? Anybody sick? You seem mighty anxious.' "'I've got a child that's very dangerous,' said Eliza. "'I never heard of it till last night, and I've walked quite a piece to-day, in hopes to get to the ferry.' "'Well, now, that's unlucky,' said the woman, whose motherly sympathies were much aroused. "'I'm really concerned for you.' "'Solomon!' she called from the window towards a small back building. A man in leather apron and very dirty hands appeared at the door. "'I say, Sol,' said the woman, "'is that our man going to tote them barrels over to-night?' "'He said he should try, if twas any way prudent,' said the man. "'There's a man apiece down here that's going over with some truck this evening, if he dares to. He'll be in here to supper to-night, so you'd better sit down and wait. That's a sweet little fellow.' added the woman, offering him a cake. But the child, wholly exhausted, cried with weariness. "'Poor fellow! He isn't used to walking, and I've hurried him on so,' said Eliza. "'Well, take him into this room,' said the woman, opening into a small bedroom, where stood a comfortable bed. Eliza laid the weary boy upon it, and laid his hands in hers till he was fast asleep. For her there was no rest. 
As a fire in her bones, the thought of the pursuer urged her on, and she gazed with longing eyes on the sullen, surging waters that lay between her and liberty. Here we must take our leave of her for the present, to follow the course of her pursuers. Though Mrs. Shelby had promised that the dinner should be hurried on table, yet it was soon seen, as the thing has often been seen before, that it required more than one to make a bargain. So, although the order was fairly given out in Haley's hearing, and carried to Aunt Chloe by at least half a dozen juvenile messengers, that dignitary only gave certain very gruff snorts and tosses of her head, and went on with every operation in an unusually leisurely and circumstantial manner. For some singular reason an impression seemed to reign among the servants generally that Mrs. would not be particularly disobliged by delay and it was wonderful what a number of counter-accidents occurred constantly to retard the course of things. One luckless white contrived to upset the gravy, and then gravy had to be got up de novo, with due care and formality. Aunt Chloe, watching and stirring with dogged precision, answering shortly to all suggestions of haste, that she warn't a goin to have a raw gravy on the table to help nobody's catchings. One tumbled down with the water and had to go to the spring for more, and another precipitated the butter into the path of events, and there was from time to time giggling news brought into the kitchen that Massa Haley was mighty oneasy, and that he couldn't sit in his cheer no ways, but was a-talkin' and stalkin' to the winders and through the porch. "'Saves him right,' said Aunt Chloe, indignantly. "'He'll get was nor oneasy one of these days, if he don't mend his ways. His master'll be sendin' for him, and then see how he'll look. He'll go to torment, and no mistake," said little Jake. "'He deserves it,' said Aunt Chloe grimly. "'He's broke a many, many, many hearts, I tell you all,' she said, stopping, with a fork uplifted in her hands. "'It's like what Massa George reads in Revelations. Souls a callin' under the altar, and a callin' on the Lord for vengeance on sich, and by and by the Lord he'll hear em, so he will.' Aunt Chloe, who was much revered in the kitchen, was listened to with open mouth, and the dinner being now fairly sent in, the whole kitchen was at leisure to gossip with her, and to listen to her remarks. "'Sitch will be burnt up forever, and no mistake, won't there?' said Andy. "'I'd be glad to see it, I'll be bound,' said little Jake. "'Chillin,' said a voice that made them all start. It was Uncle Tom, who had come in, and stood listening to the conversation at the door. "'Chillin,' he said, "'I'm afeard you don't know what you're saying.' Forever is a dreadful word, chillin. It's awful to think on't. You oughtn't wish that er to any human critter. We wouldn't to anybody but the soul drivers, said Andy. Nobody can help wishing it to them. They so awfully wicked. Don't nature herself kinder cry out on em, said Aunt Chloe. Don't they tear der suckin' baby right off of his mother's breast and sell him and der little children as is crying and holdin' on by her clothes? Don't they pull em off and sells em? "'Don't they tear wife and husband apart?' said Aunt Chloe, beginning to cry. "'When it's just taken the very life on em, and all the while does they feel one bit, don't they drink and smoke and take it uncommon easy? Lord, if the devil don't get them, what's he good for?' And Aunt Chloe covered her face with her checkered apron, and began to sob in good earnest. "'Pray for them that spitefully use you, the good book says,' says Tom. "'Pray for em said Aunt Chloe. "'Lor, it's tough. I can't pray for him. "'It's nature, Chloe, and nature's strong,' said Tom. "'But the Lord's grace is stronger. "'Besides, you ought to think what an awful state a poor critter's soul's in that'll do them our things. "'You ought to thank God that you ain't like him, Chloe. "'I'm sure I'd rather be sold ten thousand times over than to have all that our poor critter's got to answer for.' "'So I'd a heap,' said Jake. "'Lor, shouldn't we catch it, Andy?' Andy shrugged his shoulders and gave an acquiescent whistle. "'I'm glad Massa didn't go off this morning as he looked to,' said Tom. "'That ar hurt me more than sellin' it did. Maybe it might have been natural for him, but it would have come desperate hard on me, as has known him for my baby. But I've seen Massa, and I begin to feel sort of reconciled to the Lord's will now. Massa couldn't help hisself. He did right, but I'm afeard things will be kind of going to rack when I'm gone.' Massa can't be spected to be prying round everywhere as I've done, and keepin' up all the ends. The boys all means well, but they's powerful careless. That art troubles me. The bell here rang, and Tom was summoned to the parlor. Tom, 
said his master kindly. I want you to notice that I give this gentleman bonds to forfeit a thousand dollars if you are not on the spot when he wants you. He's going today to look after his other business, and you can have the day to yourself. Go anywhere you like, boy. Thank you, Massa, said Tom. And mind yourself, said the trader, and don't come it over your master with any of your nigger tricks, for I'll take every cent out of him if you ain't thar. If he'd hear to me, he wouldn't trust any on you, slippery as eels. Massa, said Tom, and he stood very straight. I was just six years old when old Mrs. put you into my arms, and you wasn't a year old. Thar, says she, Tom, that's to be your young Massa. Take good care of him, says she. And now I just ask you, Massa, have I ever broke word to you or gone contrary to you, specially since I was a Christian? Mr. Shelby was fairly overcome, and the tears rose to his eyes. My good boy, said he, the Lord knows you say but the truth, and if I was able to help it, all the world shouldn't buy you. And sure as I am a Christian woman, said Mrs. Shelby, you shall be redeemed as soon as I can bring together means. Sir, she said to Haley, take good account of who you sell him to, and let me know. Lor, yes, for that matter, said the trader. I may bring him up in a year, and not much the worse for wear, and trade him back. I'll trade with you, then, and make it for your advantage, said Mrs. Shelby. Of course, said the trader. All's equal with me. Lives trade him up as down, so I does a good business. All I want is a living, you know, ma'am. That's all any of us wants, I suppose. Mr. and Mrs. Shelby both felt annoyed and degraded by the familiar impudence of the trader, and yet both saw the absolute necessity of putting a constraint on their feelings. The more hopelessly sordid and insensible he appeared, the greater became Mrs. Shelby's dread of his succeeding in recapturing Eliza and her child, and, of course, the greater her motive for detaining him by every female artifice. She therefore graciously smiled, assented, chatted familiarly, and did all she could to make time pass imperceptibly. At two o'clock Sam and Andy brought the horses up to the posts, apparently greatly refreshed and invigorated by the scamper of the morning. Sam was there, new-oiled from dinner, with an abundance of zealous and ready officiousness. As Haley approached, he was boasting in flourishing style to Andy of the evident and eminent success of the operation, now that he had fairly come to it. "'Your master, I suppose, don't keep no dogs,' said Haley thoughtfully, as he prepared to mount. "'Heaps of em,' said Sam triumphantly. "'There's Bruno. He's roar. And, besides that, about every nigger of us keeps a pup of some nature or other.' "'Poe,' said Haley, and he said something else, too, with regard to the said dogs, at which Sam muttered, "'I don't see no use cussin' on em no way.' "'But your master don't keep no dogs. I pretty much know he don't, for trackin' out niggers.' Sam knew exactly what he meant, but he kept on a look of earnest and desperate simplicity. "'Our dogs all smells round considerable sharp. I spect they's the kind, though. They, they ain't never had no practice. They's fire dogs, though, at most anything, if you'd get em started. Here, Bruno!' he called, whistling to the lumbering Newfoundland, who came pitching tumultuously towards them. "'You go hang!' said Haley, getting up. "'Come, tumble up now!' Sam tumbled up accordingly, dexterously contriving to tickle Andy as he did so, which occasioned Andy to split out into a laugh, greatly to Haley's indignation, who made a cut at him with his riding-whip. "'I'm astonished at you, Andy,' said Sam, with awful gravity. "'This here is serious business, Andy. You mustn't be a making game. This here ain't no way to help Massa.' "'I shall take the straight road to the river,' said Haley decidedly, after they had come to the boundaries of the estate. "'I know the way of all of them.' They make tracks for the underground. Sartin, said Sam. That's the idea. Massa Haley hits the thing right in the middle. Now there's two roads to the river. The dirt road and the pike. Which Massa mean to take? Andy looked up innocently at Sam, surprised at hearing this new geographical fact, but instantly confirmed what he said by a vehement reiteration. Cause, said Sam, I'd rather be clined to imagine that Lizzie take dirt road, being its least traveled. Haley, notwithstanding that he was a very old bird, and naturally inclined to be suspicious of chaff, was rather brought up by this view of the case. "'If you weren't both on your such cussed liars now,' he said contemplatively, as he pondered a moment. The pensive, reflective tone in which this was spoken appeared to amuse Andy prodigiously, and he drew a little behind, and shook so as apparently to run a great risk of falling off his horse while Sam's face was immovably composed into the most doleful gravity. 
course said sam massa can do as he'd rather go de straight road if massa thinks best it's all one to us now when i study pon it i think the straight road de best deridedly she would naturally go a lonesome way said haley thinking aloud and not minding sam's remark dere ain't no sayin said sam gals is peculiar they never do nothin you thinks they will more generally the contrary gals is naturally made contrary and so if you think they's gone one road it is sartin you'd better go t'other and then you'll be sure to find em now my private opinion is lizzie took der road so i think we'd better take the straight one this profound generic view of the female sex did not seem to dispose haley particularly to the straight road and he announced decidedly that he should go the other and asked sam when they should come to it a little piece ahead said sam giving a wink to andy with the eye which was on andy's side of the head and he added gravely but i've studied on the matter and i'm quite clar we ought not to go that dar away i never been over it no way it's despite lonesome and, and we might lose our way whar we'd come to de lord only knows nevertheless said haley i shall go that way now that i think on it i think i hear em tell that dat our road was all fenced up and down by der creek and thar ain't it andy andy wasn't certain he'd only hearn tell about that road but never been over it in short he was strictly noncommittal haley accustomed to strike the balance of probabilities between lies of greater or lesser magnitude thought that it lay in favor of the dirt road aforesaid the mention of the thing he thought he perceived was involuntarily on sam's part at first and his confused attempts to dissuade him he set down to a desperate lying on second thoughts as being unwilling to implicate liza when therefore sam indicated the road haley plunged briskly into it followed by sam and andy now the road in fact was an old one that had formerly been a thoroughfare to the river but abandoned for many years after the laying of the new pike it was open for about an hour's ride and after that it was cut across by various farms and fences sam knew this fact perfectly well indeed the road had been so long closed up that andy had never heard of it he therefore rode along with an air of dutiful submission only groaning and vociferating occasionally that twas desperate rough and bad for jerry's foot now i just give your warning said haley i know yer yer won't get me to turn off this road with all yer fussin so you shut up massa will go on his way said sam with rueful submission at the same time winking most potentiously to andy whose delight was now very near the explosive point sam was in wonderful spirits professed to keep a very brisk lookout at one time exclaiming that he saw a gal's bonnet on the top of some distant eminence or calling to andy if that thar wasn't lizzie down the hollow always making these exclamations in some rough or craggy part of the road where the sudden quickening of speed was a special inconvenience to all parties concerned and thus keeping haley in a state of constant commotion after riding about an hour in this way the whole party made a precipitate and tumultuous descent into a barnyard belonging to a large farming establishment not a soul was in sight all the hands being employed in the fields but as the barn stood conspicuously and plainly square across the road it was evident that their journey in that direction had reached a decided finale want that ar what i tell you master said sam with an air of injured innocence how does strange gentlemen spect to know more about a country than the natives born and raised you rascal said haley you knew all about this didn't i tell you i knowed and you wouldn't believe me i telled master twas all shit up and fenced up and, and i didn't spect we could get through and he heard me it was all too true to be disputed and the unlucky man had to pocket his wrath with the best grace he was able and all three faced to the right about and took up their line of march for the highway in consequence of all the various delays it was about three-quarters of an hour after eliza had laid her child to sleep in the village tavern that the party came riding into the same place eliza was standing by the window looking out in another direction when sam's quick eye caught a glimpse of her haley and andy were two yards behind at this crisis sam contrived to have his hat blown off and uttered a loud and characteristic ejaculation which startled her at once she drew suddenly back the whole train swept by the window round to the front door a thousand lives seemed to be concentrated in that one moment to eliza her room opened by a side door to the river she caught her child sprang down the steps towards it the trader caught a full glimpse of her just as she was disappearing down the bank 
and throwing himself from his horse, and calling loudly on Sam and Andy, he was after her like a hound after a deer. In that dizzy moment her feet to her scarce seemed to touch the ground, and a moment brought her to the water's edge. Right on behind they came, and nerved with strength such as God gives only to the desperate, with one wild cry and flying leap she vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore, on to the raft of ice beyond. It was a desperate leap, impossible to anything but madness and despair, and Haley, Sam, and Andy instinctively cried out and lifted up their hands as she did it. The huge green fragment of ice on which she alighted pitched and creaked as her weight came on it, but she stayed there not a moment. With wild cries and desperate energy she leapt to another and still another cake, stumbling, leaping, slipping, springing upwards again. Her shoes are gone, her stockings cut from her feet, while blood marked every step. But she saw nothing, felt nothing, till dimly, as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side, and a man helping her up the bank. "'You're a brave gal now, whoever you are,' said the man with an oath. Eliza recognized the voice and face for a man who owned a farm not far from her old home. "'Oh, Mr. Symes, save me! Do save me! Do hide me!' said Eliza. "'Why, what's this?' said the man. "'Why, if taint Shelby's gal!' "'My child, this boy, he'd sold him. There is his master,' said she, pointing to the Kentucky shore. "'Oh, Mr. Symes, you've got a little boy.' "'So I have,' said the man, as he roughly but kindly drew her up the steep bank. "'Besides, you're a right brave gal. I like grit, wherever I see it.' When they had gained the top of the bank, the man paused. "'I'd be glad to do something for you,' said he. "'But then there's nowhere I could take you. The best I can do is to tell you to go thar,' said he, pointing to a large white house which stood by itself, off the main street of the village. "'Go thar. They're kind folks. There's no kind of danger, but they'll help you. They're up to all of that sort of thing." "'The Lord bless you,' said Eliza earnestly. "'No occasion, no occasion in the world,' said the man. "'What I've done's of no account.' "'Oh, surely, sir, you won't tell anyone?' "'Go to thunder, gal. What do you take a feller for?' "'In course not,' said the man. "'Come now, go along like a likely sensible gal as you are. You've aren't your liberty, and you shall have it for all of me.' The woman folded her child to her bosom and walked firmly and swiftly away. The man stood and looked after her. "'Shelby, now, maybe won't think this yard the most neighborly thing in the world, but what's a feller to do? If he catches one of my gals in the same fix, he's welcome to pay back. Somehow I never could see no kind of critter a striving and panting and trying to clear themselves with the dogs after em and go agin em. Besides, I don't see no kind of occasion for me to be hunter and catcher for other folks and either. So spoke this poor, heathenish Kentuckian, who had not been instructed in his constitutional relations, and consequently was betrayed into acting in a sort of Christianized manner, which, if he had been better situated and more enlightened, he would not have been left to do. Haley had stood a perfectly amazed spectator of the scene, till Eliza had disappeared up the bank, when he turned a blank, inquiring look on Sam and Andy. "'That ar was a tolerable fair stroke of business,' said Sam. "'The gal's got seven devils in her, I believe,' said Haley. "'How like a wildcat she jumped!' "'Wild well, now,' said Sam, scratching his head. "'I hope Mass'll excuse us trying dat our road. Don't think I feel spry enough for dat ar no way.' And Sam gave a hoarse chuckle. "'You laugh,' said the trader, with a growl. "'Lord bless you, Mass'll, I couldn't help it now,' said Sam, giving way to the long, pent-up delight of his soul. "'She looks so curious, a-leapin' and springin' ice a-crackin' only to hear her plump.' her cur-chunk, cur-splash-spring, Lord, how she goes it!' And Sam and Andy laughed till the tears rolled down their cheeks. "'I'll make your laugh to the side of your mouth,' said the trader, laying about their heads with his riding whip. Both ducked and ran, shouting up the bank, and were on their horses before he was up. "'Good evening, Massa,' said Sam, with much gravity. "'I very much spect Mrs. be anxious about Jerry. Massa Haley won't want us no longer. Mrs. wouldn't hear of our riding the critters over Lizzie's bridge to-night and with a facetious poke into Andy's ribs he started off, followed by the latter, at full speed, their shouts of laughter coming faintly on the wind. End of chapter 7